I think we are uh, now set to go. It is session number three of the rules. Uh, we probably should have done this at the first session, uh, but I want to uh, send a welcome to the uh, some of the women that have joined us this year uh, with the merger of the WSGA with the WWSGA. We have a number of uh, women who will be joining us as rules officials, including uh, Peg, Sandy, Maggie, Jeannie, and perhaps others. So welcome, Peg. So today we are going to do rule nine. And as always, we want to start with the definitions pertinent to that rule. The first one is known or virtually certain, page 208. Known or virtually certain, it is the standard for deciding what happened to a player's ball. So that's what you're gonna use that known or virtually certain standard for, deciding where the ball has moved. Known or virtually certain means more than just a possibility over probability, it means either, and there's two bullet points, there's conclusive evidence that the event occurred. So you hit your ball out of bounds, it goes through the neighbor's house and into his uh, living room. You now have certainty that the ball is out of bounds. Second bullet point, although there is a small degree of doubt, all reasonable available information shows that it's at least 95% likely. Notice the next paragraph. All reasonable available information includes all information the player knows and all other information he or she can get with reasonable efforts and without unreasonable delay. Does this mean that there is an obligation on the player to do this? And the answer is yes. The player cannot simply, if he hits his ball into a penalty area, assume that it's in there assume that it crossed here or it seemed that it crossed there. He has, to, he or she has to use all reasonable available information to make that uh, determination. Last thing I wanna say about this definition is although there are two bullet points and you gotta come under one or the other, obviously if it's 95% certain, then if it's 100% certain, it's at least 95% certain. So really what you're doing with known or virtually certain is that you must make the determination that you are 95% certain what happened to the ball. That's all we're talking about here. All right, next one is moved, page 211. When a ball at rest has left its original spot and come to rest on another spot, and this can be seen by the naked eye, whether or not anyone actually sees it is irrelevant. It's just whether it could have been seen by the naked eye. And this applies whether the ball has gone up or down or horizontal. Another word for up or down is vertical. So when you think of this, the question is, has the ball moved if it moves vertically or horizontally or some combination thereof? It has moved as long as it can be seen by the uh, naked eye. If the, if the ball only, uh, is at rest, only wobbles, sometimes referred to oscillating, and stays and returns to the spot, the ball has not moved. Question, yes? Is an oscillating ball moving? An os the question is, is a, quote, oscillating ball moving? And the answer is no. And the reason is because the definition of moved is it has to leave position A and come to position B and position B and B at rest on position B by an amount that is reasonable. It's moved slash one or moved slash two that makes this precise point. So if a ball is oscillating, it is not moving, even though it looks to your eye like it's going back and forth. That ball is not moving with the definition of the rules. Next one I want to talk about is natural forces. The effects of nature, such as wind, water, or when something happens for no apparent reason because of the effects of gravity. Natural forces is a very narrow term. Basically, it means wind, water, or gravity. That's it. 
Now, technically, it could include hail. If a hail storm hits and the hail hits the ball and moves it, that would be a natural force. But natural force means wind, water, or gravity. Lastly, outside influence on page 213. This is a very broad category. When we get to rule nine, we're going to see that there are only four possible causes of a ball moving. The player, the partner, natural forces, which we know is very narrow, and this other concept known as outside influence. So let's look at that. Any of these people or things that can affect what happens any person, and then it accepts out the player and it accepts out the opponent. So any person other than the player, the partner, or the caddy, or any opponent, his partner, or his caddy, that's all the other people in the world. Those people are all outside influences. Second bullet point, any animal, not just most animals, any animal. And then the third bullet point, which again is extremely broad, any natural or artificial object. It's natural forces, wind, water, and uh, gravity. So, tree branch falls down, knocks the ball. What is that? That is a natural object. Outside influence? Yes. Notice that it says an artificial object. How about a rake? How about equipment? How about another ball? Yes, that stuff is all outside influence. So the only natural or artificial object that isn't going to be included is natural forces. So it's a very broad category, and we're going to see that when we get to um, rule nine. And here's a little teaser for rule number nine. If you're walking down the fairway, it's a windy day, the wind blows your hat off, the hat strikes the ball and moves it. Here's the question. Was that ball moved by the wind? Was that ball moved by the hat? Or was that ball moved by the person? And it's gonna be important to know the answer to that. And again, this is the little tease to get you interested in Rule 9. Now we're going to move to Rule 9. If I finish Rule 9 and have not answered that question, we'll come back to it. So let's look at Rule 9. <clears throat> this is the old Rule 18, ball at rest, lifted or moved. Rule 9 covers the central principle of the game, play the ball as it lies. If the player ball comes, player's ball comes to rest and is then moved by natural forces, such as wind, water, or gravity, you're normally going to replace it. If the ball at rest is lifted or moved by anyone or any outside influence, then generally you're going to replace the ball. Bullet point three, players should take care when near the ball, because if you cause it to move, you're normally going to get a penalty, except on the putting green, and we're going to go through this. So, rule nine. Rule nine applies to a ball at rest on the course and applies both during a round and while play is stopped. So if there's a rain delay, you go in the clubhouse, you can't move your ball. You may be able to lift it and mark it, but you cannot move it to another spot. And if you do, you're gonna, there may be penalties. 9.1, ball played as it lies, central principle of the game. <laughs> A player's ball at rest must be played as it lies, except when the rules require or allow the player to, and you got two bullet points, to play a ball from another place. Okay, there are plenty of rules that allow you to play from another place. Anytime you're taking relief, you pick up your ball, you play it from another place, and that can be both penalty relief or free relief under, uh, say, Rule 16 or to lift a ball and then replace it on its original spot. So if your ball is on the putting green, you may be able to lift it up, or you're permitted to lift it up, and then you put it back. Uh, another example would be uh, you're trying to identify the ball, so you lift the ball up for identification, and then you replace it. 
9.1b, what to do when ball moves during backswing or stroke. The player's ball at rest begins to move after the player has begun the stroke or the backswing for the stroke, and the player goes on to make the stroke. So this is the key. If, you're, if you start to make your backswing and then you stop, this is not going to apply. Assuming that the ball moves either during the backswing or the stroke, the ball must not be replaced no matter what caused it to move. Instead, the, pl the player must play the ball from where it came to rest. And if the player caused the ball to move, we're going to look at 9.4b to see whether there is a penalty. The term backswing for a stroke, we had an incident last summer where the player was, as many people do, when you start the backswing, you may technically move the ball in a forward direction. There's fancy names for it, a forward press or whatever. But if you are truly beginning your backswing, the fact that the ball technically moved with the club moving forward is nevertheless still considered part of the backswing. The whole thing is the backswing. All right, 9-2. Deciding whether ball moved and what caused it to move. A player's ball at rest is treated as having moved only if it's known or virtually certain that it did. If a ball has moved, but it is not known to be virtually certain, I'm sorry, might have moved, it is treated as not having moved and must be played as it lies. So the obvious examples there is if you're on the putting green and it's just the two of you and there's no spectator, there's no one else around, and you look and you say, well, I think that moved, and your opponent says, well, I don't. I don't know if it moved. He said, well, I guess I'm not sure either. You have to be 95% certain that it moved. If it didn't, you play the ball as it lies. So the old situation that we had a few years ago with Dustin Johnson, I think it was at the US Open in 2016, questioned whether he caused the ball to move or not. He set his club down and so forth. Now the question would be, are we 95% certain that A, he caused that ball, to, that the ball moved, first of all, and then did he cause it to move? So let's look at 9.2b, deciding what caused ball to move. <clears throat> so when a player's ball at rest moved, it must be decided what caused it to move. And this determination whether the player must this, this determinate this determines whether the player must replace the ball or play it as it lies. And here's the key: four possibilities. There are only four possibilities, four possible causes of what the ball, what caused the ball to move. And you have to, as a rules official, you have to put it into one of these four buckets. That's your only choice. You can't say, well, it's not any of the four. I think it was another one. No, everything that causes the ball has to be one of these four. Natural forces, the player, the opponent, or an outside influence. And as the rules, uh, the, the reference shows, this is going to be rule 9.3, natural forces, 9.4, the player, 9.5, the opponent, and 9.6, outside influence. Known or virtually certain, this is parent two, standard for deciding what caused the ball to move. The player, the opponent, or an outside influence is treating as having caused the ball to move only if it is known or virtually certain. What does that mean? That means you can never say that the player caused it to move unless you're 95% certain that the player caused it to move. Similarly with the opponent and similarly with an outside influence. If you can't point to one of those three as the 95% cause, by default, it is a natural force. So example, you're walking down the, the fairway, your ball's on the putting green, you haven't got there yet, you look up and the ball moves. Well, you know it wasn't the player, you know it wasn't the opponent, you didn't see any outside influence, the only thing left is it's gonna be a, um, a natural force. And again, that's the default. That's bullet point two. If it's not known or virtually certain, at least one of these, meaning those three, was the cause the ball is treated as had been moved by a natural force. In applying this standard, all reasonable available information must be considered. In other words, what the rule says is this is the obligation of the player. 
the player has to determine all reasonable available information. Now, if it's a normal event with no spectators and there's only two of you, it's pretty easy. You don't have to look any farther. That's all there is. But at the higher level tournaments, when you have lots of spectators, you have the obligation, if you're unsure, to check with other people. It could be the spectators, it could be a rules official, whatever. And you then have to make that determination of you know, what caused it to move. And you have to ask somebody, did you see what happened to this ball? All right, 9.3, ball moved by natural forces. If natural forces such as wind, water, or gravity cause a player's ball at rest to move, there is no penalty and the ball must be played from its new spot. So you're walking down the fairway, you, you hit your ball onto the putting green and it's at rest. As you're walking up there, it moves. Well, it's moved by natural forces. You play it as it lies. And that's the common sense situation. The exception is ball on putting green must be replaced if moved after it's already been lifted and replaced. And this is under rule 13.1 and John's gonna go over this later this morning. But the beauty of this is it always gives me the opportunity to talk about my favorite hole in the state of Wisconsin. And that's the 13th hole at Oconomowoc, which is, convenient. which is right conveniently <laughs> right behind uh, John and Jim. You hit your ball, it's a par four. The second shot is uphill to a blind green. It's a blind shot. And the green slopes severely from back to front. So if you hit your ball, assuming the pin is in the front, if you hit your ball up the green, and it's at rest, and as you're walking up the hill, all of a sudden the wind kicks up, and now the ball's starting to roll, and it rolls 75 feet to the bottom of that hill. You play it as it lies. Now let's talk about the exception. You hit your next shot up there, and it's sitting up there. And this time you're gonna use a little more diligence. So you run as fast as you can to get to that, and your ball is at rest, you mark it. Now, since you've marked that ball, no matter what happens to that ball, you're always going to play it from that spot. So if you then mark it, uh, you wait your turn, you put the ball down, you're now surveying the situation, the ball is blown by the wind down the hill, you then get to play it from where uh, you, you simply replace it. We'll see when we get to rule 14, you don't have to go 75 yards down and get a new ball, you can actually use a substituted ball because that's one of the exceptions. But be careful of this rule. It's um, only if you've replaced the ball on the spot from which it was moved. So if you hit your ball up there and you're 10 feet from the hole, you mark it. Now you putt and it stops two feet from the <laughs> hole and you're about to tap it in and somebody else says, well, I'll, let me just putt out first. So you gentlemen or a lady, you let them putt out first. The wind now blows your ball 75 yards to the bottom of the hill. You got to play it from the bottom of the hill. Why? Because you don't come under the exception because you didn't mark and lift the ball. You marked it for the previous stroke, but you didn't mark it for this stroke. All right, 9.4. Ball lifted or moved by player. I would insert after that, but not by his equipment. This is going to be a reversal of the rules from a few years ago, and we'll go over that. We'll get to that situation we talked about with the hat uh, blowing off the person's head. This rule applies only when it's known or virtually certain that a player, including the player's caddy, lifted his or her ball. 9.4a. When lifted or moved, ball must be replaced. And here's the rule. If the player lifts his or her ball at rest or causes it to move, the player must replace it on its original spot, which if not known must be es estimated, and again, a reference to 14.2. Except, and these are the obvious exceptions, when the player lifts a ball under a rule <coughs> to take relief or to replace it on a different spot, you don't have to put it back. So if your ball's on a, a cart path and you kick it or lift it or move it, you are not obligated to replace it if you are going to play from a different place. 
Now, you may get a penalty, and we're going to see that under 9.4b, but 9.4a is saying you don't have to replace it if you're going to play it from someplace else. And then bullet point two, when the ball moves only after the player has begun the stroke or the backswing for the stroke and then goes on to make the stroke. Again, that's what we went over under 9.1. If, if, you're, if you take your uh, backswing, the ball starts to move and you continue the stroke, what this is saying is you don't have to replace the ball. Your ball has been hit, it's in play. We're gonna see under 9.4b whether you get a penalty, but what this is saying is you don't have to replace it. All right, 9.4b, penalty for lifting or deliberately touching ball or causing it to move. If you're a rules official, you sort of got to know rule nine and you sort of got to know rule 9.4b. So if the player lifts or deliberately touches his ball at rest or causes it to move, the player gets one penalty stroke. But there are a lot of exceptions. The way to frame these exceptions, or at least the way I think of them, is exceptions two, three, and four, which we'll talk about in a minute, are strictly accidental movements. Exhibit, sorry, exception one is the case where you are deliberately moving the ball, and you deliberately move it anytime you lift the ball. You cannot, under the rules, accidentally lift your ball. Lifting a ball is a deliberate action. So that's what we're talking about under exception one. There is no penalty when the player lifts the ball or causes it to move. And these are the key words which we're going to come back to under a rule. That, and here are the three bullet points. So in order to avoid the penalty, you have to come under one of these three bullet points. You have to have lifted the ball under a rule that allows the ball to be lifted and then replaced on its original spot. What's an example of that? Well, you're on the putting green. You lift the ball, you put it back. This is saying no penalty because you proceeded under a rule that allows you to lift and then replace it. Another example would be you're searching for your ball, you can't find it, you mark it, you lift it, you put it back. Again, you're not gonna get a penalty. Why? Because you've come under bullet point one. All right, bullet point two. You lift the ball under a rule that requires a moved ball to be replaced on its original spot. An example of that, you're walking down the fairway, you kick your ball. So now you've moved it accidentally. And what does the rule require you to do? It requires you to pick that ball up, lift it, and put it back. So this bullet point two is talking about the second movement of the ball, not the first. It's talking about the fact that if you then lift the ball and put it back, you're not going to get a penalty for lifting the ball and putting it back. Why? Because the rules require you to do that. Now, you may get a penalty for having kicked it initially, which we'll see when we get to two, three, four, but you do not get a penalty because you lifted the ball and you're coming under bullet point two. All right, bullet point three. You lift the ball under a rule that requires or allows the player to drop or place the ball again. We're going to see under rule 14.3 that if you drop a ball and it rolls outside the relief area, what does the rule require you to do? It requires you to lift that ball and drop it again. Or it requires you to drop a ball again, which we'll see. So the point is, if you lift that ball, to redrop it within the relief area, you've come under bullet point three and you're not gonna get a penalty for lifting your ball. Why? Because you lifted it under a rule that either requires or allows you to drop it again. <clears throat> All right, the last part of bullet point three, and it's the second clause of bullet point three. You lift your ball under a rule that allows the player to, this is the end of that, play a ball from a different place. So what is an example of that? Your ball is, in a, uh, is on a cart path. You pick it up under 16.1b to drop it someplace else. So have you played it under a rule? Have you lifted it under a rule that allows you to play a ball from a different place? Yes, you've now come under that. The last thing I wanna say about this exception is 
the phrase under a rule means that when you pick it up, you have to have the intent to proceed under a rule that allows you to pick it up. And if you don't, you haven't come under that exception. So take this example. You hit your ball uh, down the fairway. It kind of goes into the grass. You're walking down. You see a ball. And you say, oh, that's not my ball. That's a stray ball. And you pick it up. And then you look at it and you say, oh, son of a gun, that's my ball. Have you picked it up under a rule that allows the player to play a ball from a different place? No, you've just picked it up. And you say, what's the, what's the support for that? We don't normally do this, but, but this is an important uh, interpretation that you got to know. And it's 18.1. Two. Uh, it's a short rule. I'll read it for those of you who don't have your rule book, and it's it's on 255 of the official guide. Penalty cannot be avoided by playing under stroke and distance. If a player lifts his or her ball when not allowed to do so, the player cannot avoid the one-stroke penalty under 9.4b. That's just what we talked about by then deciding to play under stroke and distance. The last paragraph says the player gets the one stroke penalty under 9.4b in addition to stroke and distance. And this is the key. Since at the time the ball was lifted, the player was not allowed to lift the ball and had no intention to play under stroke and distance. So getting back to 9.4b, exception one, bullet point three, you have to lift the ball under a rule that allows the player to play from a different place. <laughs> Last example I want to give on that is assuming you're playing, since I like Oconomowoc, I think it's the seventh hole, it's a par four, it's um, you hit your ball, the draw to the left, and there's out of bounds over there, and you say, I think I've been hit a provisional ball. So you announce it correctly, you play your provisional ball, that goes down the fairway and then just kind of trickles into the rough. So you got both balls kind of in the same place. You're walking down there. You see your provisional ball. It's just fine. You look over to the left right by the out of bounds and you see a ball that you're pretty sure is yours. So what do you do? You pick up your provisional ball and you walk over. You don't find your original ball because that ball is not your original ball. You look for three minutes and you can't find it, or you look out of bounds and you find it. So now what have you done? Well, the ball in play, we all know, is the provisional ball. So you have to play the provisional ball. Where is the provisional ball? It's in your pocket. So the question is, did you pick your ball up, the provisional ball, under a rule that allowed the player to play from a different place? No, you just picked up your provisional ball with no thought at all. So what does that mean? That means you're gonna get the 9.4B penalty. So what do you gotta do? You gotta put the ball back. So you replace it. And now you lie four. Why do you lie four? You got your two talent strokes. You hit your first one out of bounds. Second is the provisional ball. You get one for stroke and distance. That's your first penalty stroke. And then you get a second penalty stroke under 9.4B for uh, uh, lifting a ball when you were not allowed to do it. Okay, um, exhibit uh, exception two. Again, we're talking about these are the ways that you can avoid your 9.4B penalty for lifting your ball. Question, is it a good policy if you're playing in a tournament to avoid lifting your ball unless you are required to? To me, the answer is obvious. You never lift the ball unless you have to replace it. Leave it on the course. Ball's on a cart path, leave it. Drop you another one. You hit a provisional ball, leave it. Nothing good happens by picking it up other than you save two bucks or three bucks. Four bucks. Four bucks. <laughs> All right. The exceptions two, three, and four deal with accidental movements. And the key, the key here is the word accidental. When a player accidentally causes the ball to move while trying to find or identify it, and it says 7 4. We went over this last week, 
if you're if you uh, are searching for your ball, you're swinging a club. As long as you are uh, actively engaged in the search, there's no penalty if you accidentally move that ball and you simply put it back. Excuse me. Uh, and your and Bill says and your actions are reasonable. And that's that was what we covered last week under seven four. Exception three. Accidental movement on putting green. And look at how broad this is. There is no penalty when the player accidentally causes the ball to move on the putting green. And listen, look at these words. Listen to these words. No matter how that happens. So when that ball is on the putting green, as long as it's accidental, you're not going to get a penalty. You can trip over it. You can drop your club on it. You can kick it as long as it's accidental. You can be... Uh, screwing around and not paying attention you can step on it again as long as it's accidental you're not going to get a penalty for moving your ball on the putting green fourth exception accidental movement anywhere except on putting green while applying a rule so what this is saying is if you're on the putting green you're going to come under three and no matter what how it's moved accidentally you're off the hook four is saying if you're anyone else on the course it's going to be a little narrower to avoid the penalty. There is no penalty when the player accidentally causes the ball to move anywhere except in the putting green while taking reasonable actions to, and then there are five bullet points. The thing to understand about this is the actions that you are taking must be reasonable under the rules that we're going to talk about. The second thing is, you have to understand the term while. This is a change in the rules. The old rule used to use the term direct, direct, directly attributable. And now the movement simply means it has to be while you're taking the action. And there's an interpretation that says while means a span of time that has a beginning and an end. And if it's during that span of time, you're not going to get a penalty for moving your ball. So as an example, you, are, uh, you, you look down, you see a ball, you're pretty sure it's yours, but you're not sure. So you want to mark it and lift it for identification. The time starts. Now you're in that wild period of marking your ball, which is the first bullet point. So you reach into your pocket to pull out your uh, quarter, you drop it, it moves. You have done that while marking the spot of the ball. No penalty. You now mark the spot of the ball. You pick it up. You decide that it's your ball. You put it back down. And as you're putting it back down, your foot slips and you kick the ball. That is still while you are marking the ball, because that's the period of time. There's a beginning and an end. And if it happens during that period, it's while you are moving it. And then the other question is, was the action reasonable? That's how you mark a ball. You take a quarter out of your pocket and you mark it. So, and there's two uh, interpretations on that under 9.4b. Mark. Removing a loose impediment, sorry, moving, removing a movable obstruction. So let me give an example of that. Your ball is in a bunker. It is up against a rake. We're going to see under 15.2 that you have the ability to uh, move the rake. It's a movable obstruction. So you reach down with your hand, and as you reach the rake, the ball moves. Is that a reasonable action? Sure. How else are you going to move the ball? Or you get your sandwich, you reach it down because it's a little bit underneath, you put the club underneath the rake and you lift it up. Is that a reasonable action? I think so. What if you then take the rake, the ball hasn't moved, you set it on the edge of the bunker and before you can do anything else, the rake kind of goes back and forth, falls down and moves the ball. That's still a reasonable action. It's done while you are attempting to move the removable obstruction. Reasonable. An example of what would not be reasonable is when the player uses, a, uh, I'll call it abusive actions. Frustration, the player takes the, takes the rake and instead of setting it out, he throws it out of the bunker, hits the side of the bunker, comes back and moves the ball. 
That's not going to be reasonable actions. Why? Because reasonable people take reasonable actions. Reasonable people do not act abusively. And that's an abuse when you throw clubs. Okay. Pardon me? Oh, right. Right. Um, and then the other uh, measuring. Notice the one thing that is not on there, which you need to be careful of. Uh, what is not on that list is moving a loose impediment. And this is, we're going to cover this under 15.1. If you move a loose impediment, no matter how careful you are, and the ball moves, it's a penalty because you haven't come under one of those. All right, 9.5. Ball lifted or moved by opponent in match play. This rule applies only when it's known or virtually certain that the opponent, including the opponent's the opponent, his partner, or his caddy. If the opponent lifts or moves the player's ball, the ball must be replaced on its original spot, which, is, which was not known, must be estimated. And then you have the exceptions, which are obvious exceptions, when the opponent is conceding the next stroke, or when the opponent lifts or moves the ball at the player's request. Again, generally match play, uh, the player misses the putt, player says, throw that ball back. So you throw it back to him. Obviously, there's no penalty to the opponent for that. And you don't have, you don't have to replace the ball. All right, 9.5B. Notice also the structure of 9.4 is the same structure as 9.5. 9.4A and 9.5A talk about when you're obligated to put it back. 9.4B and 9.5B talk about when you're going to get a penalty. The opponent lifts or deliberately touches the player's ball or causes it move, you get a one stroke penalty. But as we saw under 9 4, there are a lot of exceptions. Exception number one, opponent allowed to lift the player's ball. We just went over this quest. Second, marking lifting player's ball on the putting green by mistake. There is no penalty when the opponent marks the spot of the player's ball and lifts it on the putting green in the mistaken belief that it's his own ball. So what that means, if you, if A and B are playing a match, they hit on the putting green, A goes over to mark his ball, he puts down his quarter, he very nicely picks it up, and he says, oh, this is B's ball. What this is saying is there is no penalty for that. You simply replace the ball. As long as it is a mistaken belief. And the key there is mistaken. If you deliberately pick up your opponent's ball, you're going to get a penalty stroke. Exception three, <clears throat> excuse me, exception three. Same exception as for the player. There's no penalty when the opponent accidentally causes the ball to move while taking any of the actions covered by two, three, or four under uh, rule 9.4b. Meaning, that if the, if the opponent moves the player's ball and any of exceptions two, three, or four applies, there is no penalty. Exception two, then I need to go, the, the opponent needs to replace the ball and then the player needs to remark it, correct? Um, let's repeat that. Opponent, the opponent has marked the ball, picked up the ball, marked the ball. The player needs to go and replace the ball and then mark it. Uh, the the question or is, or that, that the opponent by mistake picks up the player's ball, then discovers it. I think the question is, who has to put it back? We're going to see when we get to Rule 14 that the ball always can be replaced by the player or the person who picked it up or caused it to move. So in this case, either the player or the opponent can replace that ball. Uh, 9.6, ball lifted or moved by outside influence. If it is known or virtually certain that an outside influence, including another, uh, another there is no penalty and the ball must be replaced on its original spot which if not known must be estimated. All right, so let's go back to the question I posed when we started rule nine. If 
players walking down the fairway. The wind comes up. The wind blows the player's ball. I'm sorry, plays the player's hat, and it moves the player's ball. What caused that ball to move? Was it the player? Was it the hat? Or was it the wind? Hat. It's the player's equipment. It's an outside influence. There's also a rules uh, interpretation on this. It's 9.6 slash 1 that makes precisely that point, that if the wind blows something that then moves the ball, it is the something that has caused it to move, not the player and not the wind. So in this example, it's a hat. That's the player's equipment. That's an outside influence. That is a change in the rules from two years ago, Gary. I see you. Yeah, but OK. So well, the ball moved by an outside influence. That, that's the. <laughs> well, he didn't throw. The move in that situation. Everybody understand that it? it's the player? Because that hat is part of him. He is moving the hat. It is the player that caused it to move, not the hat. But if the hat blows off and then it's going down the fairway or whatever and it runs into the ball, it is the hat that caused the ball to move, not the player. All right, so 9.6 says, and the ball must be replaced on its original spot, uh, which if not known must be estimate, estimated. How do you get the ball back in play under the situation? I promised Jim Coakley I would tell this story. We were on the ninth hole at University Ridge for the Boys State Tournament. Uh, it's a par five. The player hits a long drive, hooks it. When you hook it left on number nine, it then can go over into the first fairway. And there's, a, there's rough between nine and uh, one. So the player hits it down there. Eventually, he can't find his ball. Jim and I are called, and we say to the player, he says, well, I don't know where the ball is. And there's people on the cart path, and the rule at University Ridge is that you roughly 50 yards away, and they're yelling that the ball landed in the rough right by the first fairway. And so we go over there, and we say, I'm yelling at them, and I say, this area? And they say, yeah, I was right there. Did you see it land? Yes. Did you see the ball come to rest? Yes. Well, where is it? Some lady picked it up and went up to the clubhouse. So we said, are you sure? And the guy said, yeah, and there was two spectators. All right. Is it known or virtually certain that it was moved by an outside influence? Do you have to go up and find the lady and take the ball back? No. You have to be 95% certain that it was moved by an outside influence. So we, Jim and I, concluded that it was. Now the question is, how do you get the ball back in play? We're going to see this under Rule 14.2, but there's an interesting interpretation under 9.6. You estimate the spot. So you get up there and you say to the player, the player says to me, and of course it's a high school kid, and he sees an older guy with white hair, with the thing on, it says rules official, so he knows that I know exactly where to put the ball back. So he says, where do I drop the ball? And I said, well, first of all, you're not going to drop the ball. You're going to replace it. And secondly, you're going to estimate the spot. And he looked at me like, and he says, estimate it? I just hit a 300-yard drive that hooked into the, how do I know where it was? And I said, well, these people up here say it's in this 10-foot area. So you get to drop it, in, you get to replace it, in that 10 foot area. Well, where do I replace it? And I said, well, you have to estimate it and you have to use your reasonable judgment. And he says, reasonable what? I said, okay, look, you gotta put it back in this spot. And he says, how about this spot right here? And he points down at the rock. And I said, that's just fine because that is a reasonable judgment. What about a spot that's three inches over? That's a real 
can't tell the player you must place it right here. The only thing I can tell the player is you have to use your reasonable judgment. And then when he asks you, is it reasonable? I would then conclude that it is because how else can we make a determination other than to do that? Okay, there is an interpretation on that that says, if there are two spots that are equally as likely, and the best you can do is know that it's 50-50, uh, basically, either one of those is a reasonable judgment, and the player then simply replaces it and plays on. The real question is, how did the woman get 50 yards <laughs> when there is supposed to be someone, generally speaking, you know, all the way that works there, yeah. on both one and one, yeah. in that, uh, I'm just saying. Yeah, well, we we had a little discussion uh, offline that said basically if you have to stay on the cart path, how can you get 50 yards off the cart path? And of course, if you know anything about the Boys and Girls State Tournament at University of Ridge, that's the constant battle that rules officials have. Get back on the cart path, everybody. Get back on the cart path. All right. Apparently, we have a question online, Bill. Very good. Uh, the question is, what happens if the opponent replaces the ball on the green, and before the player can mark the ball, the ball moves because of the slope of the green. Does the player, quote, own that spot since it was marked by the opponent? Ever understand that question? And the answer is you're going to have to look at 13.1 to figure out the answer. And in 9... Four or nine three, uh, the exception it says if the player's ball on the putting green moves after the player had already lifted and replaced the ball on the spot. A technical reading of that says player, it does not say opponent. And the player's question is, um, what if the opponent marks it? My, if I was the rules official on the spot, I would say you have come under this because the spirit of this rule is the ball has been properly marked by a person. Again, you don't technically come within it, but if I was the rules official, that's how I would rule. And in addition, when the person says, what's the authority for that, I would say 20.3. That's the old equity rule that says you apply, if you're not sure of an outcome, you use uh, analogies to other rules. <laughs> yeah, well, the question is, who are you going to radio to? Okay, and that's John Morris said. John Morris said, I'm now radio. What is your opinion on that? Well, no, I am defending the point's rights. Okay, what if you call that person on radio? What is that person? And, you know, I think the same thing. All right. Well, Dan, I have to say, I'm. Um, I'll be surprised that once again you're just throwing the text of the rules out the window. <laughs> just just because Dan tends to lecture us about not doing just that. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, it, um, interesting in the exception in 9.3, it does say that the exception is titled Ball and Putting Green must be replaced if it moves after having been. already been lifted and replaced and does not elude to whom the text within the rule does elude to the player so it is interesting that the title of it does not match the text of it uh, for those of you who didn't hear that we did have a discussion um, offline I was accused by John Morris of not reading a rule literally I explained my rationale for not reading it literally um, and there you have it. Okay, the last, the last part of Rule Nine is nine point seven ball marker lifted or moved. This rule was about to do with the ball marker that is marking the spot has been moved. Nine point seven a, uh, the player's ball marker is lifted or moved in any way. You replace it, or you replace the ball. Those are the two bullet points. Notice. If your ball is on the putting green and you have your ball marker down there and then someone steps on the ball marker, it sticks to their feet and then they walk away. What this rule is saying is that you do not technically have to get the ball marker, put the ball marker back 
and then put the ball down. What this rule is saying is you got to get the ball back in the spot that it was in when it when the when the ball to put the ball back in the spot. So you can do that without putting the ball marker back. It may be a good practice to get the ball marker and put it back, but you're not obligated to do it. 9.7b is a very simple rule. Um, you look at the exception. Well, it says if a player or his opponent lifts or moves the ball marker or causes it to move, the player gets a one-stroke penalty, except and then what the exception says is in all circumstances, in all cases in which you wouldn't get a penalty if it was the ball, you're not going to get it if it's the ball mark. In other words, 9.7 doesn't do anything other than to say we're going to treat the ball marker as if it were the ball. That's all that says. Any questions on Rule 9? The wonderful rule. I think John is going to do 10. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Dan, and good morning, everyone. Uh, today, first, thanks for everyone for coming on a Wednesday as opposed to our normal uh, Friday. But today, in part because uh, next week uh, I'm going to be out of town and Dan's going to lead the session in its entirety, I will uh, cover the next uh, four rules. We're going to try to get through uh, rules 10 through 13. The rest of the day, and uh, so let's cover Rule 10, possibly Rule 11, and then uh, we'll uh, take a break. All right, Rule 10, which deals with preparing for and making a stroke, talking about advice, talking about help a player may and may not receive, and talking about uh, caddies, what who uh, what a player's allowed to have, as a, how many caddies a player may have, and what a caddy may and may not. Do. Uh, we'll start with a few definitions, uh, first of which is advice. And this is a particularly important uh, definition, just because the advice rule itself, as we'll see, is pretty straightforward. And most of the uh, questions that come up regarding the advice rule really revolve more around the definition of advice and whether a statement or a question constitutes uh, giving advice or asking for advice. Uh, so advice is any verbal comment or an action, such as, you know, if I tee off on a par three and I hit a seven iron, winds up short of the green, and I stick the seven iron in Bill's face, you know, that's treated the same as my having told Bill I hit a seven iron. Uh, but it's a com comment or action that is intended to influence a player in choosing a club, making a stroke, or deciding how to play during a round. And the uh, in, intention aspect is important. So let's say, for example, Bill and I are playing together on a, we're on a par three hole. I have the honor, and I hit a seven iron, and I come up short, short of the green, and then I say, oh, I can't believe I came up short with a seven iron, or I can't believe seven iron wasn't enough. So am I considered to have given Bill advice? Well, the answer depends as to what my intention was with that statement. If I was just saying that exasperation, then uh, there's no penalty. But if I was saying that for the purpose of telling Bill that, so, so as to influence his uh, club selection, then that would be considered uh, advice. Uh, advice does not include uh, public information such as location of things on the course, whether it's uh, the layout of the whole, whole location, uh, uh, even uh, golf balls, uh, the distance from one point to another. So, for example, if uh, Bill and I are playing together and I finally invested in a, in a range finder and Bill does not have a range finder, uh, and he asked me on several fairways uh, to tell him how far he is from the hole, that is okay. And matters on the rule, uh, rules are not uh, advice. So, it's okay for players to help each other with. Uh, uh, rules situations. Uh, next definition, caddy is someone who helps a player during a round, including, uh, not ne but not necessarily limited uh, to the following ways, uh, carrying or transporting or ha handling the player's clubs. Uh, this person is the player's caddy, even if, if not named as a caddy. So, for example, let's say Bill's playing in a tournament and I am 
is his friend. I want to be out there to support him. Carts are allowed, and I drive the cart for him. You know, whether Bill and I think I'm his caddy, I am his caddy because I, by driving the cart, I'm transporting his clubs. Now, the answer would be very different if I were merely riding in the cart not performing any of the other functions of a caddy. But if I am driving the cart, then I am uh, uh, Bill's caddy. Uh, caddy, you know, uh, you know, one of the most useful uh, functions of a caddy is to give the player advice. He's one of the, in, the, in individual play, he's the only person who's allowed to uh, give the player advice. And as we'll see, a caddy may help the player in other ways as well. Uh, definition of stroke. Uh, first section of this rule talks about how a player may and may not uh, make a stroke. And this is an important uh, definition on page 219. A stroke is the forward movement of the club, <laughs> meaning the downswing. Dan talked about uh, a backswing, and that is not uh, part of the stroke. So forward movement of the club made to strike the ball made with the intention of striking the ball. And if you're not intending to strike the ball, then you have not uh, made a stroke. So let's look at these uh, uh, two bullets where the player is not considered to have made a stroke. First of which is if during the downswing, he decides, so he makes a conscious decision not to strike the ball. Perhaps, um, you know, he, he heard a uh, camera click and that striked it in and he wants to uh, stop the stroke. So he decides during the downswing not to strike the ball and, and he avoids striking the ball by deliberately stopping the club head before re it reaches the ball or if he can't stop it before reaching the ball, he deliberately misses the ball, say swings over the ball. Then he's not considered to have made a stroke. Now second case is if the player accidentally strikes the ball while making a practice swing or while preparing uh, to make a stroke. So if the player uh, hit, accidentally hits the ball with a practice swing, he hasn't made a stroke because he didn't intend to strike it. But if we go back to the rule Dan just covered, he has moved his ball. And, and we have to look at whether the ball was in play uh, when he moved it. Um, and, and if so, uh, uh, the, uh, whether there's a penalty which could which uh, depend as to what, where on the course has happened, putting green or elsewhere. Uh, let's see, when the rules refer to playing a ball, that's the same as making a stroke. The player's score for a hole is described as a number of strokes, which makes, which includes the strokes physically made as well as any penalty strokes uh, incurred. All right, back to, yeah, yeah, Doug. That's interesting because I know there was the old decision about if you, you know, determining whether the player had intentionally decided not to make the stroke but still strike the ball. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, an old decision on that. So this is saying that that no longer exists. You don't have to determine. If you don't miss the ball, you're going to get it considered a stroke, even if during the downswing you tried not to hit it, but you do hit it. Yeah, I, and Doug asked, I asked a question regarding an old decision under old rule 14 regarding a player whose intention to strike the ball ceases during the downswing and he does or does not uh, strike the ball. And this definition basically includes that uh, decision. And the old decision said, well, if he does not miss the ball, then there's not enough evidence to support the notion that he was trying to miss it. And you know, this just makes it more clear to say that, okay, if you if your intention to strike it ceases and you don't strike it, you're not considered to have made a stroke. But let's look at the other side. If your intention to strike the ball ceases, but you do strike the ball, then you are considered to have made a stroke. If you start the downswing with the intention, strike it, that intention ceases, but you still strike the ball, you are considered to have made a stroke. So it's consistent with that old decision. And, you know, and that's a great example of you know, one of you know several hundred old decisions that are now in the rules themselves, so we don't have to scratch our heads. You know, looking for that, it's more black and white now. All right, uh, rule ten purpose uh, covers how to prepare for and make a stroke, uh, including advice and other help. The underlying principle is golf is a game of skill and personal challenge, and that's one of the key themes. 
that uh, the rules makers think that it's up to the player to do to preserve the challenge of the game and to make sure that the player who has the best game uh, and not necessarily merely the best caddy, for example, uh, will uh, uh, win. Rule 10.1 talks about uh, the method for making a stroke, and this has its own uh, purpose statement. Uh, it covers uh, making a stroke and several acts that are prohibited while making a stroke. Uh, the fundamental challenge is to direct and control the movement of the entire club by freely swinging the club, which means, therefore, you can't anchor it. That if the uh, uh, principle is that the club is meant to be swung freely, then that means you can't uh, anchor it. So that helps us explain, well, that gives us some insight as to why uh, anchoring this is prohibited. It's because it's on the philosophical ground that, um, you know, the club should be swung freely uh, during the stroke. All right, 10.1a, uh, fairly striking the ball. In making a stroke, the player must fairly strike at the ball with the head of the club. So if the head of the club means any part of the club head, so that would include, for example, the toe of the club or the back of the club head. If you're, say, in an awkward uh, situation uh, next to, say, against a tree or a boundary fence, such that there's only momentary contact, and that's an important phrase, momentary contact between the club and the ball, and uh, a player must not push, scrape, or scoop the ball. So. A uh, player must strike at the ball at the head of the club with just momentary contact. So, for example, if the ball is wedged between two tree roots and the player puts the ball, puts the club head under the ball and lifts the ball out, you know, there's going to be more than just that momentary contact between the ball and the club head. He would be considered to uh, scoop the ball in breach of this rule. If the player's uh, club accidentally hits the ball more than once, there's been only one stroke and there's no penalty. So that is a change for 2019. So if a player, for example, is near the, is on a par three hole, his tee shot uh, just misses the putting green, he double hits the chip shot and the ball goes into the hole, what is his score for the hole? It's two, it's a two. Rule 10.1b, now anchoring the club. Uh, something that's been around since 2016. In making the stroke, the player must not anchor the club uh, either directly or indirectly, as we see in the two bullet points. Uh, a direct method of anchoring that's prohibited is by holding the club or the gripping hand against any part of the body, except the player may hold the club or gripping hand against a hand or the forearm. So, for example, you see some uh, players on television with a putter, long putter shaft that extends up their form, and that is okay because of that parenthetical exception. A player must not anchor the club indirectly by uh, using an anchor point, uh, by holding a forearm against any part of the body uh, to use a gripping hand uh, as a stable point around which the other hand may swing. So that, so you can't get around the first point by simply putting your forearm against your chest with the hand away from your body and get and achieving the same result. That is also prohibited. Uh, next point is important. If the uh, player's club, gripping hand, or forearm merely touches his or her body or clothing during the stroke without being held against that, there's no breach. That The uh, rule really talks about holding uh, the club or gripping hand or, or a forearm. Then we talk about uh, what form means. And then, you know, we have another one of these helpful illustrations on the next page in terms of what is and is not allowed under the rules. You see in the top left, the uh, what we talked about with putter shaft extending up the forearm, uh, that's allowed. Top right, uh, the putter pu uh, pressed against the person's stomach is not allowed. Uh, bottom left, where the player uh, where the club, the gripping hand, and the forearm are all away from the body, um, uh, that is okay. But then bottom right, the forearm is pressed against the body, creating an anchoring point, which is not uh, permitted. 
Rule 10.1c talks about uh, a stance uh, the player uses while making the stroke. The player must not make a stroke uh, anywhere on the course from a stance with a foot that has been deliberately, emphasis on deliberately placed on each side of, or with either foot deliberately touching the line of play or an extension of that line behind the ball. So this is what prohibits the old uh, so-called croquet style line of putting where a, pl a player putts uh, between her legs. That is not uh, permitted. And notice it talks about line of play or an extension of that line behind the ball. So given that text, you know, a common uh, frequent question is what happens if the player has a six inch putt, the player is on feet or on one side of the hole, the player reaches across the hole to the ball and taps it in. Um, and the player is player's feet or stride and extension of the line of play beyond the hole. Is there any penalty in that case? And the answer is no, because the prohibition with the stance is it can't be um, on uh, each side of or the either foot touching line of the line of play itself or an extension of that line behind the ball, but it's silent on beyond the hole, which means that is okay. And then remember when we talked about line of play, we said line of play normally includes a reasonable distance on either side, but for the purpose of this rule only, it uh, does not. Uh, an important exception that there's no penalty if the stance is taken accidentally. Uh, for example, a player has a, a uh, short putt and the player simply not aware of where her feet are with relation uh, to the ball and line of play, or the player deliberately takes such a stance for the specific purpose of avoiding another player's line of play. So the player has a short putt, the player knows the only way to avoid standing on the other player's uh, line of play and stroke play is to uh, take a stroke stance with each foot on extension of the line of play but if it's for that purpose then that's okay and th that works well that what this ex exception ensures is this rule accomplishes what it's intended to accomp accomplish and that is to prohibit players from using a croquet style of putting as a an intended uh, method for, for making a stroke consistently let's see here we have an online question Please further clarify with example situations where a player tries to stop his swing but in the process moves the ball whether on the tee or elsewhere. Um, okay, well it's, it's, it's very straightforward in that if the, uh, going back to uh, rule 10.1a, that if the player starts the downswing, starts the stroke with the intention of striking the ball but then let's say there is a noise and the player uh, the player's intention to strike the ball ceases, but the player, player's reflexes, for example, are not as good as Tiger's, uh, and the player winds up striking the ball, the player is considered to have made a stroke. That uh, the player's not considered to have made a stroke uh, under the definition of stroke only if the uh, intention to strike the ball ceases and the player does not strike the ball. Rule 10.1D. Uh, playing a moving ball. Uh, question that came up earlier, and we'll uh, talk about this. Uh, in general, player must not make a stroke at a moving ball. A ball in play is moving when it's not at rest on a spot. And then to uh, address the question earlier about whether a player may play a ball that's oscillating, we'll look at this second bullet point. If a ball that has come to rest is wobbling or oscillating, but it stays on or returns to the original spot, it's treated at, as being at rest and not a moving ball. So therefore, it's okay to play it. But there are three exceptions when there's no penalty, i.e. when a player may play a moving ball. Exception one <clears throat> is if the ball begins to move after the player begins uh, the backswing, the player goes ahead. So the player uh, addresses the ball, the ball starts to move during the backswing, and the player goes on, makes a stroke at the ball, even while the ball is in motion. Now, there's no penalty for playing a moving ball. Uh, exception two, it, but I mean, there can be situations where we have to 
are going to have to look at, well, what caused the ball to move in the first place and whether there could be a penalty under Rule 9 for having caused the ball to move. But there's no penalty simply for playing the ball while it is moving in those circumstances. Uh, exception two, uh, uh, Dan talked about last week, in, if the ball, if a teed ball falls off and the stroke is made at the ball while it's moving in such circumstances, uh, there is no penalty. And the third exception is for ball moving in water. And this uh, provision now applies both to water in a penalty area and temporary water. So if a player comes across his ball, let's say in a creek, in a penalty area in water, or in temporary water in the fairway, the player may play the ball even while it's moving, uh, or the player may take relief under the appropriate rule. Or the player, uh, yeah. In either case, the player must not unreasonably delay play to allow the wind or water current to move the ball to a better place. So if the ball is in, let's say in a current of water, in a creek, a penalty area, and the player thinks, you know, if I wait for a minute, this ball may well wind up being deposited on this uh, 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 piece of land down here, or it'll become less shallow, and I can have a better chance to play it. Uh, the player may not uh, do that. All right, so with all sections of the rule, the all four sections of Rule 10.1, uh, the penalty is the general penalty. And the uh, uh, um, sentence after that is particularly helpful. Then in stroke play, a stroke made in breach of this rule counts and the player gets two penalty strokes. So in match play, it's not that important that if a player, for example, makes a stroke using, uh, while anchoring the club, the player simply loses the hole, very straightforward. But if that happens in stroke play, what score does the player put down or the player's marker put down on the scorecard. And that is that the player will count the stroke that was made, even though it was an improper stroke, whether it was say a push or a scrape or an anchored stroke or st uh, with an improper stance or the ball was in motion, the player still will count that stroke, but then will add the two penalty strokes uh, for that. All right, uh, rule 10.2, advice and other help. Again, a reminder of the purpose of this rule, which helps put this rule in context. Fundamental challenge for the player is assign the strategy and tactics for his or her play. Uh, so there are limits to the advice and other help the player is allowed to get. Uh, first section, 10.2a, talks about advice. We went over that uh, important definition. And the rule itself says that, provides that during the round, so this does not apply before the round, after the round, or while play has been stopped. A player must not give advice to anyone in the competition who's playing on the course, so give unsolicited advice. So if Bill and I are playing together, and, and I tell, tell in, let's say individual stroke play, and I tell Bill, uh, you know, you better hit one more club, there's more wind up there than we think, even though Bill didn't ask for that. Since Bill didn't ask for that, there's no penalty to Bill, but I am penalized for giving him advice. Now, if I ask anyone for advice other than my caddy, then I'm going to be penalized. So if, if I ask Bill, Bill, do you think I should hit a six or a seven here? I am going to be uh, penalized. And, uh, uh, an addition, a clarification, is that a player is not allowed to touch another player's equipment for the purpose of learning information that would be advice if, if given or, or asked for, such as if you know, Bill knows I'm um, a very competitive person and he keeps his towel on top of his clubs uh, during the rounds, and I say, well, you know, I know an easy way around that. And I just go over and remove the towel while he's teeing off on a par three to see through process of elimination what club he's using. Then I am going to be in breach of this rule. All right, other help, 10.2b, uh, uh, which has uh, four or actually five sections. And there's a lot here, so we'll just go through, through them uh, one at a time. First, talking about 
point out a line for play for the ball anywhere except on the putting green. And then the next section we'll talk about uh, what the player may have done when his ball is on the putting green. The player may, except on the putting green, a player may have his line of play point out by having uh, his or her caddy or any other person stand on or close to a line of play to show where it is, but that person must move away before the stroke is made. So, you know, the common example is um, blind shot over a hill, ask someone to go up there and, and show me where the flag stick is, that that is okay, but that person needs to move before I actually uh, play the ball. Now, it, it, or if I'm playing by myself or no one wants to help me, I could go up and place a towel on the hill to indicate where the flag stick is, but then I have to go up and remove that towel before I uh, play. Now, anyone may do that uh, for the player. Now, the second point uh, talks about only on the putting green. We'll see it's going, it's, this is it's going to be much more restricted. Before the stroke, only the player and his or her caddy, or if it's a partnership event, the partner or partner's caddy, may point out the player's line of play. Now, now, why do we say that? Well, because on the putting green, you know, one, you're not going to hopefully have any blind shots, and two, uh, you know, by uh, pointing out a line for play is really what? Advice. So therefore, only the people who are allowed to give you advice are allowed to point out uh, the line of play, but with some limitations. You will see that these limitations are separated based on a person touching the putting green versus setting an object down. Uh, first bullet point, player or caddy may touch the putting green with a hand, foot, or anything he or she is holding, such as a flag stick or another club, but must not improve the conditions affecting the stroke. For example, must not uh, improve uh, the line of play. So there, touching uh, is allowed uh, by the person, but uh, that person must not set down an object anywhere on or off the putting green to show the line of play, even if that object is removed before the stroke. So touching is okay, but setting down an object is not okay uh, at any time. Now, while the stroke is being made, the caddy must not deliberately stand in a location on or close to the line of play to point out the line of play. So it's okay to touch to indicate saying here, aim here five inches right of the hole, but then you have to move, whether it's your finger, your flag stick, or another club from that spot before the player plays. Uh, but there is the important exception of the caddy attend the flag stick that obviously the caddy is allowed to uh, do that during the stroke. All right, now the third section, 10.2B3, which is new for 2019. And it gets back to the uh, premise that a player needs to line himself or herself up uh, uh, on uh, his or her, uh, by his or her, on his or her own. A player must not take a stance for the stroke using any object that was set down by or for the player to help and line up his feet or body, such as a club set down on the ground. If the player takes a stance in breach of this rule, he or she cannot avoid penalty by backing away and removing the object. So if, a, so if I'm struggling with my play and I set, set a club down on the ground uh, to help me line up, but then before I play, I remove that club, I am going to be, be penalized. And that is a change uh, for uh, last year. If I did it after making a stroke, that would be permitted, right? Oh, if you did after a stroke saying, well, wait a minute, look where my divot hole is and look where were my feet, then the, 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 that, that is okay. Uh, all right, now 10.2B4, a, uh, a, another <laughs> change, uh, and we'll go over more than just what's in the uh, rules book itself here. And again, keep in mind the general premise is that Players need to need to line themselves up, and that's what this rule is uh, trying to accomplish. And when the player begins taking the stance until a stroke is made, the caddy must not deliberately stand in a location on or close to an extension of the line of play behind the ball for any reason, 
and if the player and then we'll um, ignore the second bullet point and uh, with the third and with an exception we'll talk about so with all this let's go through those of you who have your apps on your phone they're listed there but uh, uh, last winter, the USGA and RNA issued uh, several clarifications on this point, which are available either through the app, and there should be a little reminder button under Rule 10.2b4, and it's also available um, on the website. Uh, issued several clarifications for how this rule uh, is to be applied, and let, let's go go through through these. Now, the first of which is the meaning of begins taking a stance for the stroke. Uh, so it says rule 10 2 before is not allow a player to have his or her caddy deliberately stand on or close to an extension of line of play behind the ball when the player uh, begins taking the stance uh, for the stroke goes on to say the stroke means the stroke that is actually made and that's an important point. So therefore, if the player begins to take the stance for the stroke that is actually made, or the player begins to take the stance for the stroke that's actually made when he or she has at least one foot in position for that stance. So that's an important point. Begins to take a stance means at least one foot, if not both feet, are in position. Um, second, now if the player backs away from the stance, he or she has not taken a stance for the stroke that is actually made, and therefore, that second bullet point that we skipped over does not apply. And that's an important point. It's helpful for players uh, and uh, can be useful for rules officials. For example, if, you're, uh, if you see a player who has a caddy uh, uh, standing behind the player, you know, after the player has at least one foot in position, but before the player plays, you can say, whoa, whoa, hold, hold on, hold on. Your caddy is still back there. The caddy needs to move. So then if the player backs away and then takes the stance again with the caddy not standing back there, the player avoids penalty. So that's, uh, so as rules officials, that can be handy and some, and you know, with, uh, uh, you know, a caddy or another player that that can be handy, that there is the ability to correct that, that if the uh, player steps, uh, steps away from the ball uh, and the caddy then steps away and the, player retakes the stance without the case standing back in their place, then there's no penalty. That's so the player, the player could have taken the stance, but then backs away to avoid it. So the two little sections here that says cannot avoid penalty <laughs> by backing away are now both no. Right? That, that's right. That, 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 that bullet point. For you, 10 had a 2B4, but not 3. Yeah, yeah. For, for, for 10 to 2B4. Two Three, the player cannot avoid penalty. If the player right. takes a stance with the club on the ground, and then the rules official says, "Oh, hey, wait a minute, you can't do that." And the player picks up the club, steps away, retakes a stance. The player is still going to be penalized. But in ten to be four, the player can avoid that. So what I'd say is, in the rules book, right next to that second bullet point, just write C clarifications, or perhaps even uh, draw a line through that bullet point. Um, and the key is all that down is that the player has to back away. If that's right. If Eddie backs out of the way while he's in a stance and the player doesn't move, you're already you're going to penalize. Uh, that, that, that's right. That both things have to happen. That the player needs to back away and the caddy needs to back away before the player takes a stance again. So the clarification goes on with uh, to say, say that with through an example and saying this apply and for emphasis, this applies anywhere on the course. Uh, second clarification talks about the uh, deliberate requirement uh, under this. Examples of a cat of when the caddy is not deliberately st stand behind the player's ball. Rule 10 2B4 does not allow a player to have his or her caddy deliberately stand on or close to an extension of line of play behind the ball for any reason once the player begins taking the stance for the stroke. Now, the use of the term deliberately requires the caddy, and these are two important bullet points, um, requires the caddy to be aware that one, the player is beginning to take a stance for the stroke, and and so both these have to be met, and two, uh, the caddy is standing on or close to an extension of the line of play behind the ball. 
So therefore, if the caddy is unaware of either of these two things, then the caddy's action is not considered to be deliberate and there would be no breach of this rule. So some examples of when the caddy's action is not considered to be deliberate include uh, when the caddy's raking a bunker or some other action and is not aware that he or she happens to be on an extension of line of play behind the ball. Or the player makes a stroke and the ball comes to rest near the hole, taps up, taps into the ball, while a caddy is unaware he or she is standing on or close to an extension. Is maybe that the caddy might be watching players play the next hole or so, something like that, and the caddy simply is not aware of where he or she is in relation to the uh, extension of the line of play. So we don't need to go through um, all those, but then the final paragraph. Uh, or, or, or the paragraph under those four examples is important. That once the caddy becomes aware that the player has already begun to take a stance for the stroke and uh, the caddy is aware that he or she is standing on or close to an extension of the line behind the ball, the caddy needs to make every effort to move out of the way. So if the caddy becomes aware of that, the caddy needs to uh, move to the side. Uh, and then, you know, some other, uh, the next paragraph is, is helpful dealing you know, with some common acts of a caddy that are unrelated to the player setting up to the ball, such as checking if the club will hit a tree, uh, whether the player has interference, and holding an umbrella over a player's head for the stroke are not treated as deliberate actions. After helping, player, after helping the player with such an act, there's no penalty so long as the caddy moves away before the stroke is made. Uh, clarification on this topic. Alignment help before player has begun taking the stance for the stroke. Uh, in a situation where a player has not yet begun to take his or her stance, but the player's feet or body are close to that position, you know, so close that useful guidance on aiming could be given and the caddy is deliberately standing on or close to an extension line of play behind the ball, the player is treated as having begun to take a stance for the stroke, even though the feet uh, uh, may not yet be in that position. Only if, this is the important part, only if the caddy actually does give the player help with alignment. So, if, if, but if alignment help is given, but the player backs away, for the stroke and the caddy then moves, there's no breach. So uh, the, the very important clarifications, probably the most important clarifications the RNA and the USGA have issued uh, dealing with uh, a new rule. And fortunately, Bill, I would say that I not, my sense was that this year or last year rather, things went pretty smoothly in, this, in that regard, WSGA events. Yeah, and I, I was wondering if we could touch on the subject of a coach in high school or college and how that all pertains to it and what local rules need to be in effect for the coach to be also under the... Okay. All right. Uh, the question then of what about a coach standing behind the player? Uh, now, once the player begins to take the stance. Well, if we look in the clarifications issued by the RNA and USGA under Rule 24, uh, there's one whose title is, and as Dana said, a lot of titles with new rules as well as clarifications are very helpful. Advice giver must not deliberately stand behind player. An advice giver is the term the rules uses, the rules use for someone who's authorized uh, to give advice, such as a coach in high school or, or college uh, play. If an advice giver deliberately stands behind a player and when he or she starts to take a stance, if the player asks or authorizes the advice giver to do this, he or she gets the uh, general penalty. But if the player did not ask or authorize the advice giver to stand in that location, but knows that that is not allowed, and does not take reasonable steps to object or stop that from happening, the player gets the general penalty. So when you add that together, so there's a penalty if uh, the player asks the coach 
or allowed the coach to stand back there. The player sees that the coach is standing back there and the player knows that is not allowed and the player does not ask the coach to move, then there'd be a penalty. So when would there not be a penalty? Well, for example, if the player uh, is simply unaware that the coach is not allowed to stand back there, uh, that that would not be a penalty for the player. So part, a lot of this is going to be education, both for the coaches and for the players. And this clarification is in effect regardless, but they would have to have the model local rule in effect allowing oh. an advice here. Oh yeah, yeah. If the coach is not allowed to give advice in the first place, then there's there's no, no then the coach is as a, as a spectator, as a parent, and then there, there'd be no issue. So that comes up only you know, when the coach is allowed to uh, give advice. All right, uh, rule 10.2b5, uh, physical help and protection from the elements. A uh, player must not make a stroke. So that's the key is this applies, these prohibitions apply during the stroke, during the downswing. A uh, player must not make a stroke while getting physical help from his or her caddy or any other person. You know, there's the famous clip from uh, uh, out at uh, Cypress Point during the, um, now the AT&T one year where you had a, st a string of people, you know, trying to keep, I forget if it was Jack Lemon or somebody yeah. from falling off a cliff. Someone was holding on to his belt during the stroke and <laughs> all that. And that would be considered getting, receiving physical help uh, during the stroke. Uh, a player must not make a stroke with his or her caddy or any other person or object deliberately positioned to give protection from sunlight, rain, wind, or other elements. So, you know, for example, common thing we'll see on television, we saw some of it uh, this weekend, players are allowed to, or a caddy may hold an umbrella over a player's head up to the moment the player makes the stroke, but not during the stroke. And that can be tricky, especially say, you know, when there's a short tap in that there have been some incidents on the professional tours where a caddy just not thinking, thinking you know, the cat, the player just has a two inch putt, holds the umbrella over the player's head during that two inch putt and the uh, player's been penalized. That would be a good test question too. Well, well it's, it's a type of thing that I mean, almost, it would be a good test question, especially if there could be video. You know, to say, okay, you know, as a rules official, you see this. Any problem with what happens uh, during this? And, you know, you have to be on your toes to, to notice that. You know, not so timely thing. And I have been dying to ask you this. Um, it says under rule 10.2b, uh, parent three, about uh, setting down an object to help in taking a stance. The question is, what about the use of some of the new putters? that stand on their own. Uh, you line up with the putter standing up and continue to use that putter. Is that uh, fall under that? Okay, so, so there's a question about using some of the putters on the marketplace that can stand up uh, on their own, and that was allowed under the old rules, and that's really a question, you know, it's, uh, you know, self somewhat for the equipment folks, but uh, my sense, my understanding is that, that is uh, still permitted uh, uh, from, from uh, under the equipment rules. Uh, so now back to 10 to B5, you know, just clarifying after the bullet points that it's okay to accept the help or protection before the stroke, but there are some limits such as, um, as we saw in the two previous sections, and it goes on to say this rule does not prohibit the player from taking his or her own actions uh, to protect against elements while making strokes, such as by, you know, if the player wants to tap in a short putt by holding an umbrella over her head, that's okay. So penalty for breach of rule 10.2 for any of these five sections will be the general penalty. And as a reminder, that means in stroke play that, for example, if someone makes a stroke with the caddy behind the player, the, the stroke does count and the player will add two penalty strokes. All right, uh, 10.3, talking about uh, caddies. We uh, 
went over the definition earlier. The purpose of the rule, the player may have a caddy to carry his clubs and give advice and offer other help during the round, but there are some limits about what the caddy may do. The player is responsible for the caddy's actions during the round uh, and will get a penalty if the caddy breaches the rules during the round. So first section, player allowed only one caddy at a time. Player may have a caddy, uh, but a committee uh, through local rule could prohibit the use of a caddy as uh, you often see, say, in uh, junior and collegiate events. But a player may have a caddy who can carry his clubs, give advice, and help in other ways, both these limitations. Player must not have more than one caddy at a time. The player may change caddies during a round, but must not do so temporarily for the sole purpose of getting advice from the new caddy. I feel like in, in the last six months or so, we've seen some examples on television where a tour player has fired his or her caddy in the round and either carried the bag or you know had someone else uh, carry it for the rest of the round. And that is okay. So, I, what's prohibited, and it's a little bit of a stretch, but it still needs to be uh, addressed to prevent abuse is a case where, let's say I'm uh, Bill's caddy, um, I'm and I'm merely a bag bag carrier. I don't know anything about the golf swing or can't read a green or anything else. And Bill is playing; he's ha having a, a terrible round. But then his high profile teacher is following along, uh, and Bill's dying to ask the teacher, "What am I doing wrong? Why am I missing every fairway to the left?" So what this means is Bill cannot simply switch caddies for half a hole and have his instructor caddy form, say, for the first half of the 10th hole, just so the instructor can tell him uh, what's going on with this swing, what, what's wrong with the swing. That would be prohibited. Is that why? Because that's really a way of, to circumvent the advice rule, isn't it? But, but if Bill wanted to switch caddies and say, hey, I want my instructor to caddy for me for the back nine, then that's okay. Yeah, it, it's it's where it says may not do so temporarily for the for the sole purpose of getting advice. Just for online in my own reference, where does the temporarily end? So you're not allowed, not allowed to ask these questions. <laughs> you know, I, I, I if you're going to ask those questions, still going to what constitutes temporarily, then I'm going to give you one of those annoying answers to the flaw at the Right. <laughs> Less than a whole. Uh, uh, I I don't know. I'm not sure I'd necessarily pin it down to that, but uh, I think that would be you, you know it when you saw it is yeah. the type of thing. Okay. So it's a combination of the duration and the purpose for, for, for the switch. Because you know you could have a case where you might say, hey, I want my instructor to caddy for me for the back nine. And then legitimately, midway down the 10th hole, your instructor throws out his back and can't carry your bag anymore. You know, that wasn't the original intent. You know, you wanted him for the entire back nine. Or we can so, bathroom break for the yeah. caddy, if you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> and let's see, a penalty for breach of this rule. So how could a player, oh, and I'm sorry, for first, uh, let's go on, uh, I skip way ahead. Right after those two bullet points, there's an important uh, paragraph. Whether or not a player has a caddy, any other person who walks or rides along with the player and carries other things, could be rain suit, snacks, what have you, is not the player's caddy unless he or she is named as such by the caddy or also carries, transports, or handles the player's club. So common question situation, say junior golf, parents walking along, carrying a drink, or carrying a snack, uh, carrying a rain suit in case it rains, that person is not considered to be the player's caddy, even though you know, that person is doing a favor for the, for the, the player. Uh, second section, two or more players may share a caddy. You know, you know, very common practice, uh, you know, in daily play, uh, such as, you know, at Aaron Hills on a daily basis. But, you know, you don't see it that much in uh, competition. But if it, it does arise in competition, this tells us how to apply the rules. Now, if there's a rules issue involving a specific action of a shared caddy, 
and needs to be decided which player the action was taken for, then we look at uh, these two bullets will tell us what to do. If the action, caddy's action was taken at the specific direction of one of the players sharing the caddy, then the action was taken for that player. So if I'm Bill's caddy and Bill tells me uh, to go uh, rake an area or to break off a tree branch or something like that, then I'm considered to be Bill's caddy for that action. I'm not considered to be Dan's caddy, who's the, Dan's the other person who's uh, sharing me. But if none of those players specifically directed that action, the action is treated as taken for the player sharing the caddy whose ball was involved. So if Bill's ball is under a tree, and on my own, without Bill or Dan saying anything to me, I go over and break a tree branch that interferes with Bill's backswing, then since Bill's ball is involved, uh, Bill would be penalized in that case. Now the penalty statement. Uh, the player gets the general penalty for each hole during which he or she is helped by more than one caddy at a time. And if the breach happens or continues between holes, then uh, the penalty applies to the next hole. So uh, several points here. First, how can a player breach this rule? Play, well, the player limit, the rule limits the player to one caddy at a time. So if a player does have multiple caddies, the player is in breach of this rule. And note that the penalty is uh, different. That's going to be general, the general penalty for each hole. And what is no longer there? There's no yeah. longer a maximum. So let's say that uh, you know I'm a beginning golfer and I'm excited. I'm playing in my first tournament and I ask, uh, I ask two friends to caddy for me. I say here, you can carry the odd numbered clubs, you can carry the even numbered clubs. And you know, I you know, and I, I think that's neat. It would be a nice team effort, real bonding experience. And you know, uh, we play several holes, then a rules official happens to come across us. Well, what's going to happen? Well, if it's stroke play, I'm going to get a two stroke penalty for each hole where, where that occurs. Now, uh, what happens if let's say a situation where a uh, rules official watches my group on the first screen from a distance from several hundred yards away, says, whoa, that looks like John might, like that fellow might have two caddies. Then the rules official makes his way but doesn't get to me until say we're walking to the second tee. And he says, it looks like you have two caddies. Oh, well, yeah, Bob is carrying the odds, Joe is carrying the evens. You know, isn't that cool? You know, I'm really excited. And the rules official kind of rolls his eyes. And then what would be the penalty in that situation? It'd be two penalty strokes at the first hole and two penalty strokes at the second hole. So in order to avoid that penalty on the second hole, when does the player need to stop having two caddies? But before he, hold, before he holes out on the, on the first hole. Exactly. Exactly, because once he holds out, then he's between holes and the subject penalty of the next hole. Is there a rationale as to why the penalty applies to the next hole? I think the rationale is that the player could benefit between holes. And that what if both caddies, for example, team up and say, look, our conclusion is that you're taking the club back outside and blah, blah, blah. You know, the player could, could get some benefit between holes for, that would apply to that. Probably applies to all penalties applied to the next hole, right? That there's some information that can help you on the Yeah, I, I, yeah, and the exception to that in terms of uh, penalties for the next hole is with uh, clubs, for example. Yeah, you know, with, with uh, All right, uh, next section 10.3b talks about what a caddy may do. Uh, actions uh, that are always allowed. Uh, allowed to carry, transport, or handle the player's clubs, and that includes pulling them on a trolley or driving a cart, uh, search for the player's ball, uh, give information, advice, and other help uh, before the stroke, such as pulling out the line of play, uh, smooth bunkers, or take other actions to care for the course, uh, remove sand and loose soil and repair damage on the putting green only, which we'll cover later under Rule 13. 
Uh, the caddy is allowed to attend or remove the flag stick. And then uh, the next one is a new is a change for 2019 is that the caddy on the putting green may mark the spot of the player's ball and lift it and as well as replace it even if the caddy did not if the player did not specifically ask the caddy to do so but that applies only on the putting green elsewhere on the course the caddy may not lift the player's ball without the player's authority uh, the caddy may clean the player's ball when, when it's allowed to be cleaned. And the caddy is allowed to remove loose impediments and movable obstructions. Now, the second section will talk about uh, what the caddy may do only when authorized by the player. Uh, in, in such cases, it goes on to say that the authorization must be given each time rather than generally for a round. Uh, first, as we saw last week under Rule 8.1D, when the uh, conditions affecting the stroke have been worsened, in certain situations, the player is allowed to restore those conditions. Um, so the caddy may do so, but only when the player specifically authorizes the player to do so. The second bullet point we touched on uh, just a minute ago, when the ball is anywhere other than on the putting green, the player may lift the ball um, only if the or the caddy may lift the ball only if the player has authorized uh, the uh, caddy to do so so now third section actions not allowed uh, by the caddy now the caddy is not allowed to concede the next stroke hole or match uh, to the opponent or agree with the opponent on the match score that's something that should fall strictly between the players themselves the caddy may not, uh, as we saw in the previous rule, deliberately stand on or close to an extension line of play behind the ball once the player begins taking the stance. Uh, the caddy may not replace a ball unless the caddy was the one who lifted or moved it. The caddy may not drop or place a ball, uh, as only the player may do that. And the caddy may not decide to take relief under the rule. The caddy may suggest that, say, boss, I think this is a good time to use the unplayable ball rule, but uh, ultimately it's the player's uh, decision. Rule 10.3c, player responsible for the caddy's actions and breach of the rules. A player is responsible for the actions during the round and while play is stopped, but not before or after the round. If the caddy's action breaches a rule, or would breach a rule if the action was taken by the player, then the player gets the penalty. So for example, the player may not use the caddy to get around just to circumvent a rule. When application of rule depends on whether the player is aware of certain facts, the player player's knowledge is treated as including whatever is known by the caddy. So the player is considered to know whatever the caddy knows. So it could be, for example, uh, you know, when it talks about knowledge or virtual certainty or something like that. So that is rule 10. Many different sections that, uh, you know, we're now actually into the part of the rules where we're talking about uh, uh, making strokes and uh, method for making the stroke, how to go about making the stroke and so forth. Yeah. I ran up against a quiz question last night on uh, 7.1, searching, caddy searching for the player's ball. Can the player tell the caddy to wait up, don't get down there until I get down there? Yeah. Okay, all right. right. Uh, that's a good question. Let's say you have a situation where uh, the caddy is 100 yards in front of the tee because of maybe a shortcut from the previous green. Uh, I get up there, hit a wild shot into the trees on the right. My caddy takes off, but I know that as soon as I or my caddy get down there and start searching for the ball, three minutes will start. So I yell ahead. And I say, Dan, don't hold up until I get there. Is that okay? And the answer is yes, that, that, that is fine. John, one of the things, wasn't there a clarification too that the caddy can lift a ball if he knows that his player is going to take relief? Yeah, well, if, if the caddy, know, if, for example, the player says something like, yeah, we're going under unplayable or you know, makes it clear that that's what he's going to do, then the play, then the caddy could lift the ball in, in such a case. But what is not allowed is for the caddy just lift the ball and 
and say, hey, we're going unplayable before the player himself has made that decision. All right, uh, rule 11, uh, uh, sure, let's see, uh, break, oh yeah, why, why don't we take a break? We'll take a, uh, we'll take a 10 minute break and we'll resume just after 10 o'clock. I didn't wait. Whatever. Uh, resume and with uh, rule 11. Uh, earlier Dan covered uh, what happens under rule 9 with a ball uh, in play and at rest that's been moved and with rule 11 we're going to talk about what happens with a ball in motion that uh, uh, strikes someone or something. Uh, we don't have any definitions for this rule, so we'll start uh, with the per, uh, purpose statement. Rule 11 covers what to do if the ball in motion hits a person, animal, equipment, or anything else on the course. Uh, when this happens accidentally, emphasis on accidentally, there's no penalty, and the player normally will accept that result, whether good or bad, and play the ball from where it comes to rest. Rule 11 also restricts the player from deliberately taking actions to affect where a ball, his, whether his or someone else's in motion might come to rest. So a nice uh, touch with the new rules we see right here after the purpose statement before uh, the first section of the rule, it tells us when this rule applies. It applies any time a ball is in motion uh, after a stroke or otherwise except when it's been dropped and has not yet come to rest. And that's, is, as you'll see next week, rule 14 specifically talks about what to do if a drop ball is uh, stopped. Uh, rule 11.1, .1, uh, ball in motion accidentally hits a person or outside uh, influence. First point is, as Dan talked about with the uh, titles and subtitles to the rules, very helpful. No penalty to any player. If uh, ball motion accidentally hits a person or outside influence, there's no penalty. This is true even if uh, the ball hits the player, the opponent, or any other uh, player or their caddies or equipment. There's no penalty. Emphasis, again, on accidental, uh, with the exception being then stroke play if the ball is played from the putting green 
and the ball strikes another a ball in play at rest on the putting green uh, that was on the screen before the stroke. Then the player who putted gets the general penalty of two strokes. And that's a, an important exception. And let's go through that because at first it seems a little uh, complicated, but it really isn't. Let's say that Bill and I are playing together in stroke play. We get up onto the putting green. Uh, Bill's ball is on the putting green and he leaves it there. It's my turn to play. Uh, my ball is on the putting green. My ball strikes Bill's ball. I, the person who putted, will get two penalty strokes. Bill gets no penalty. And as Dan told, told us earlier, Bill would have to replace his ball. Now, what if my ball had been on the fringe of the green and Bill's ball had been on the green? I chip, my ball strikes Bill's ball. In that case, no penalty uh, to either of, either of us and Bill would still replace uh, his ball. So why is there, a, is there a penalty only in stroke play? Well, because in match play, you know, for example, if, if Bill, uh, you know, Bill, ha it's up to Bill to uh, stay alert and to protect his own interests. And if he thinks that his ball might assist me, then he has every right to say, John, stop. Uh, don't putt until I, I lift that ball. But in stroke play, though, when there are potentially 154 other players concerned with my putt, I'm putting the penalty on me, the person who putted, that makes it in my own interest, gives me incentive to lift my ball or to have Bill lift his ball before I putt to make sure I don't benefit from that. So that is the philosophical reason for that uh, exception. So now we know that, except for that exception, there's no penalty if the ball accidentally strikes a person or outside influence. Now, where do you play the next shot from? Um, the 11.1b says the ball must be played as it lies. So in general, players kind of play the ball as it lies, whether that's from a better spot or a worse spot. But uh, there are two exceptions uh, to that. Uh, exception one, when the ball played from anywhere except on the putting green comes to rest on any person, animal, or moving outside influence. So if it comes to rest, let's say in a spectator's pocket, you're not going to require the player to play the ball out of the pocket or frankly even give them the option, uh, thankfully, to play the ball out of the person's pocket. Instead, the player must take relief. So how will the player go about taking relief? Uh, anywhere except on the putting green, the player is going to drop either the original ball or another ball in a relief area. And the reference point's gonna be right under the spot where the ball came to rest, let's say in the person's pocket. The player is going to have a one club length area within which to drop the ball. But with the limits must be in the same area of the course as the reference point. So if this happened in the general area, I, I would need to drop the ball in the general area and may not drop closer to the hole than that reference point. Now, if this happened on the putting green, now, somehow, then the player is going to place the original ball or another ball on the estimated spot right under where the ball first came to rest um, on the person, animal, or moving outside influence using the procedures you'll talk about next week on Rule 14. Uh, exception two, uh, when the ball was played from the putting green, and it accidentally hits any person, animal, or movable obstruction, including another ball in motion on the putting green. The stroke doesn't count, so that's a matter of fact. And the original ball or another ball must be replaced, and the player must replay the, the stroke. Except in these cases, which are uh, come from, uh, out of necessity, that if the ball in motion hits another ball at rest or a ball mark on the putting green, the stroke does count, and the stroke is played as it lies, but as we just saw, that there could be a penalty if this happened in stroke play. And if the ball in uh, second uh, exception is the ball in motion accidentally hits the flag stick or per person attending the flag stick, well, in a little bit under Rule 13, we will see what the uh, consequence is uh, for that. 
Now, penalty for incorrectly substituting a ball or playing a ball from the wrong place would be the general penalty. All right, on to rule 11.2. 11.1 dealt with accidental deflections. Now 11.2 talks about deliberate deflections. First, when does this rule apply? This applies only when it's known or virtually certain that a player's ball was deliberately deflected or stopped by a person. So and now we have kind of an internal definition of what is meant by de deliberately deflected or stopped. That is common version is the person deliberately touches the ball in motion. You know, I see Bill's ball rolling somewhere and I intentionally stick out my foot to stop the ball. I have deliberately deflected or stopped Bill's ball. The second one's um, a little more subtle, and that is that uh, the ball in motion is considered to have been deliberately deflected if it hits any equipment or other object, for example, a rake or a person that a player deliberately positioned or left in a particular location so that the equipment, object, or person might deflect or stop the ball. And this is a new provision and that bullet point you know seems like a lot and that there's an interpretation that really helps walk us through that and that is interpretation 11.2a slash 1 that's on page uh, 161 and let's just go through that to make sure we're all on the same page about what that second bullet point means uh, Interpretation states that Rule 11.2 applies to a situation where a player did not initially position the equipment, object, or person for the purpose of deflecting the ball, but once positioned by the player, he or she realizes, realizes it may deflect or stop the ball and deliberately leaves it there. So a key phrase is in that third line where it says, once positioned by the player. So that this applies only when the player has touched that item, has put that item there. It does not apply, uh, for example, to a rake that was left in a perhaps a friendly position by a player in a previous group. So let's go through a couple of examples. Uh, the first one deals with a case where there is a penalty. After raking a bunker, the player places the rake between the putting green and the bunker without any thought of it influencing a ball. But the player now has a downhill putt with the bunker just beyond the hole. He realizes the rake could stop the ball and plays without first moving the rake. The player putts and the ball is stopped by that rake. Now in that case, there's a penalty and a key point is that what? The rake was put there by the player. Even though the player didn't intend to put it there for that purpose, once because it was put there by the player and the player then realizes it, uh, its uh, relationship and how it could help him, then he, uh, he is responsible. Uh, second exa example, uh, there is no penalty. A rake's been left by a preceding group between the putting green and bunker. A player who has a downhill putt towards the bunker sees the rake and leaves it there because it might stop the ball. The player putts and the ball is stopped by that rake. Now in that case, there's no, there's no penalty. And what's the difference between the two? In the first example, the player had put the rake there himself. In the second example, uh, the rake was put there by a player in a previous group. So that is why the answers are uh, different. All right, now there, there's an exception and we'll see versions of this in a few places uh, throughout the rules that an opponent's ball in motion that is, so we're talking only about uh, match play, an opponent's ball in motion that is deliberately deflected or stopped at a time when there is no reasonable chance it can be hold and when it's done either as a concession, for example, I, uh, I miss a putt as it's going past the hole, Bill knocks it back to me saying, that my next putt is good. Um, or as we saw earlier, uh, a couple of weeks ago, when the ball needed to be hold to tie the hole and, the ball, and that will not happen, that uh, rule three uh, will cover that. And in which case, if, in, 
in those circumstances, uh, there would not be a penalty for deliberately deflecting or stopping a ball in motion. Uh, rule 11.2b, so we've talked about when the rule applies. Now we'll talk about uh, when the player gets the penalty. The player gets the penalty, and it's the general penalty, if he or she deliberately deflects or stops a ball in motion. So meaning that that deflection actually occurs. If player tries to deflect a ball in motion and is not successful, then there's no penalty. So this does fall into that no harm, no foul uh, category. Uh, exception with the ball moving in water, there's no penalty if a player lifts his or her ball moving in uh, water when uh, taking relief, as we saw under Rule 10. All right, so we've talked about when the rule applies, when there's a penalty, but now there's the big question of, okay, there has been a deliberate deflection, where does the player play the next shot from? If it's an accidental deflection, the default position is that what? Player generally plays the ball where it winds up, good or bad. But uh, we're going to treat a deliberate def deflection uh, differently. If it's known or virtually certain, that the ball in motion was deliberately deflected or stopped, it must not be played as it lies. Instead, the player must take relief. And, we'll, and the relief will depend, the procedure will depend as to where that uh, stroke was made. If it was made anywhere except from the putting green, then the player is going to take relief based on the estimated spot where the ball would have come to rest if it had not been deflected or stopped. So now we're going to have to have some judgment involved here and, and it will need to be a reasonable judgment. So when the ball would have come to rest anywhere on the course except on the putting green, so a common example is say at a, um, let's say a, a, tele, a PGA Tour event, a spectator sitting behind, standing behind a green sees a ball coming towards him or her and without thinking intentionally bats the ball away. Then, you know, the player is in the uh, general area where this happened in the general area and, and the ball would have, let's say, looked like the ball would just come to rest farther behind the putting green. Then the player is going to drop uh, either the original ball or substituted ball in a relief area whose reference point is the estimated spot where the ball would have come to rest. So you say, okay, if the spectator hadn't batted that ball away, where would that ball have come to rest? You identify that spot, that'll be your reference point. Then the player will drop within one club length of that. And if this is in the general area, the player is going to have to drop in the general area and, and not drop near the hole. Now, if the ball would have come to rest on the putting green, then the player is going to place the original ball or substitute ball on the estimated spot where the ball would have come to rest. So no club length here going to place it right on the estimated spot um, using the procedures that Dan will cover next week in Rule 14. And then uh, to close things out, if the ball would have come to rest out of bounds, then it's not the player's lucky day. He has to proceed as if the ball did go out of bounds and must proceed under stroke and distance. <laughs> So that's for a ball played anywhere other than from the putting green. You look at where the ball would likely have come to rest and then with those three possibilities. Now with the second section, talk about if, what happens if the stroke had been made from the putting green. Now in this case, the stroke, it's going to be a more straightforward procedure. The stroke does not count and the original ball or another ball must be replaced. So the player must replay the stroke, but the stroke does not count. Uh, penalty for uh, incorrectly substituting balls or playing from a wrong place. You know, what would be an example of a wrong place under this rule? Well, what if the ball would have come to rest on the putting green and instead of placing on the estimated spot, the player placed a club length from the estimated spot and played. That would be a wrong place. All right, now, uh, that's 11.2. 11.3 uh, talks about deliberately moving objects or altering conditions to affect a ball in motion. So this is the third thing that can happen to a ball in motion. We talked about an accidental deflection, talked about deliberate deflections. Now we're going to talk about altering other things, for lack of a better term, that could affect 
uh, that ball in motion. So while a ball is in motion, a player must not deliberately take any of these actions to affect where that ball might go. And this ball could be the player's own ball, it might be another player's ball. So the player may not alter physical conditions by taking any of the, any of the actions listed in Rule 8.1a, uh, such as replacing a divot or pressing down a raised area of turf. So if a player sees a ball, uh, whether his ball or someone else's ball, slowly trickling back down the shaved bank of the green, uh, into an area of lob divot holes. And he rushes over and replaces some divots and some divot holes while that ball is in motion. Uh, um, then uh, th there would be an issue with that. Uh, the player may not uh, lift or move a loose impediment or movable obstruction that could influence that ball in motion. You know, we saw a video of that at the Kapalua tournament several years ago with Camillo Bajegas, where he moved some detached divots out of the way of a ball that was pulling back towards him. But we have some exceptions. Uh, this rule does not prohibit a player, which means that a player is allowed to do the following. The player uh, is allowed to lift or, or move a removed flag stick, a ball at rest on the putting green, in this second one, ball at rest on the putting green is a change for 2019. And what does the player need to remember to do with that if it's the player's own ball that he's lifting? He needs to mark its spot. So the player mm -hmm. needs to think quickly and act quickly in order uh, to do that, uh, in order to avoid penalty. And the player is also allowed to uh, move any player equipment. Uh, so, you know, so if Bill thinks that my bladed sand shot might hit my golf bag or his golf bag. He's allowed to remove that golf bag out of the way while my while the ball's in motion. Now, penalty for breach of this rule is the uh, general penalty. All right, any questions on rule 11? Yeah. Can you store, I mean, let's say you move to a loose impediment and the ball's rolling, I'm going to get that out of the way. Can you correct your deliberate action okay so the question is that you see but your ball let's say for simplicity your ball is rolling towards a loose impediment you go over and remove that loose impediment so the ball won't strike it then you realize oh my gosh i'm not allowed to do that could you if you're very quick replace that loose impediment and avoid penalty and well uh, let's look at the rule itself, what triggers the breach? A player must not deliberately take any of these actions to affect where the ball might come to rest. So once the player has taken that action, he's in breach of the rules. And unlike rule 8.1, there's no mechanism in this to undo that. So, so 11 the, and 2, you can, no harm, no foul, but 11, 3, and 10, you know, you're out. That, 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 that's correct. So you know, we saw earlier 8.1c allows the player to correct some breaches of rule 8.1a, but there's no equivalent of that under this rule. So therefore, as soon as you do that, uh, you are penalized. All right, let's go on with rule 12. Rule 12 is a nice specific and relatively short rule dealing with bunkers. So let's start with the definition of bunker. A uh, bunker is a specially prepared area of sand often a hollow from which turf or soil has been removed. And uh, these items are not part of the bunker. A lip, wall, or face uh, consisting of soil, grass, stacked turf, i.e. sod, or artificial materials. That is not part of the bunker, and that is a change. So therefore, exactly, so by, so by default then, what part of the course area of the course would say that lip of a bunker that uh, that doesn't have sand on it what our area of the course would that be it would be the general area and then this is a change for 2019 and it's a and it carries some significance and that what then is the ruling if a player's ball embeds in that exposed lip well now the player's ball is embedded in its own pitch mark uh, in the general area. So now the player does get free relief uh, 
for that. So that so that is a change. Well, <laughs> and likewise, then there is a clarification. <laughs> And there is a clarification that I'm sure Dan will go over with Rule 16 about that in terms of how the relief procedure for the embedded ball in such a situation could be uh, interesting. Uh, also not part of the bunker is soil or any growing or attached natural object, you know, such as, you know, bushes, things like that. Sand that's spilled over or is outside the edge of the bunker is not part of the bunker. And all other areas of sand on the course that are not inside the edge of a prepared area, you know, a naturally sandy area, such as you might see at the Sand Valley here, or you might see in the Pinehurst area in North Carolina, or you might see it along the coast. Uh, bunkers are one of the five defined areas of the course we went over uh, the other week. Uh, something new for, uh, 2019, a committee may define a prepared area of sand as part of the general area, which therefore means it's not a bunker. Or on the other side, a committee may define a non-prepared area of sand as a bunker. So this has come up, for example, when uh, there have been some events, the uh, Ryder Cup or PGA Championship at the Ocean Course at Kiowa, and PGA of America has said that Basically, there are no bunkers on the course, that all sand is part of the general area. And the reason they did that is that so many of the bunkers are not clearly defined, where the dunes just kind of come in and then create a bunker, but it's not clear where the bunker stops or starts. Uh, so now, you know, this just makes it clear that a committee may do that. Uh, the next paragraph's a nice uh, addition for the committee as well, that if a bunker is being repaired and the committee is defined the entire bunker as ground under repair, then it's treated as part of the uh, general area, which means it's no longer a bunker. And that can have uh, some significance in that, I mean, for example, I remember the Marquette tournament last fall at uh, uh, Aaron Hills, there was a situation on the um, 15th hole where we had just had a lot of rain before and uh, during the early part of that tournament, there's a bunker that's uh, low on the left-hand side that was just flooded and you know, we tried to pump it out, but it was just always going to remain flooded. So we said the entire bunker is ground under repair, which meant then that that bunker is not then part of the, uh, is no longer a bunker, meaning that <clears throat> your ball is, winds up in the middle of it. You do, you do not take relief in the bunker. You come out to take relief. So, uh, with that in mind, let's uh, look at the rule. Uh, with the purpose statement, it mentions that to make sure the player confronts the challenge, i.e. that, you know, because playing a ball out of sand is more difficult than playing it out of turf, and to make sure that that challenge is preserved, there are some restrictions about what the player may do in the bunker, as well as the relief options for a ball in the bunker. You know, we have a diagram talking about uh, when a ball is in a bunker, which is what the first section of the rule covers. Ball's in a bunker when any part of the ball touches the sand on the ground inside the edge of the bunker, or is inside the edge of the bunker and rests on ground where sand would normally be, such as a washout area, or it's in or on a loose impediment, removable obstruction, such as the rake in this illustration. Um, or integral object that touches sand in the bunker or is on ground where sand normally uh, would be. If a ball that lies on soil or grass or other growing or attached natural objects, the ball is not, without touching the sand, the ball is not in the bunker. So in this illustration, you, know, you put the first section of this rule together with the uh, definition of bunker, we know that the ball and that's in on the face of the bunker is not in the bunker. Uh, the ball lying on the sand in the bunker is in the bunker. The ball lying on the grass island is not in the bunker. And then the ball lying on the rake is in the bunker, even though the ball itself is not touching the sand. 
All right, so what are the rules for you? Yeah. If that rake were touching the sand, but the rake were out of the bunker and the ball was on the rake outside of the edge of the bunker, is it considered in the bunker or out of the bunker? The rake is out of the bunker, but touching the sand. And the ball is on top of the rake, but outside the edge of the bunker. So. Oh, oh, okay, so, so you're saying, what if the ball is on on the part end of the rake that's not in the bunker? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, here, well, let's see, what, what does this say? Well, first and the second bullet point is when any part of the ball is inside the edge of the bunker. So in that case, if the ball is somehow lying at the tip of that rake outside the bunker, then it's not inside the edge of the bunker. So then we don't even need to look farther than that. So that ball would not be in the bunker. So I guess I'm confusing that with the or integral object that touches the sand in the bunker. Well, I, I, th I think before we get there, we even need to just read the se second bullet point itself. It's when any part of the ball is inside the edge of the bunker. So in your example, if the ball is, say, at the edge, at the handle of the rake, mm -hmm. and all of the ball is beyond the edge of the bunker, then it's not, not going to be in the bunker no matter what. Does, does that make sense? <clears throat> All right, uh, rule 12.2, playing the ball in the bunker. It goes on to say this rule applies during the round and while play's been stopped. Uh, before playing a ball in a bunker, the player may remove loose impediments. And that is new for 2019. And the player may remove movable obstructions, such as a rake. This includes any reasonable touching or movement of the sand in the bunker that happens while doing so. So for example, if there's a soft drink can in the bunker and while picking up the can to remove it, the player's fingers touch the sand, that's okay. 12.2B, uh, uh, restrictions on touching, touching the sand in the bunker. So there are some, still some restrictions we'll see. And these restrictions apply before the stroke. So they apply before the downswing. So as we'll see, touching the sand with the club during the backswing is still not allowed. So before the stroke, before the downswing, the player must not deliberately touch sand in the bunker with the hand, club, rake, or other object uh, for the purpose of testing the condition of the sand to learn information for the next stroke. So the player still may not do that. Now, a slight twist and a slight change. If I'm in bunker A, before I play, may I go over to bunker B and take some practice swings there? And the answer is yes. Because why? Because this first bullet point talks about touching sand in the bunker, meaning the bunker in which the ball lies. So that, so that part, allowing the player to go to a different bunker, is a change. Second bullet point, the uh, player must not touch sand in the bunker with the club in these circumstances. In the area right in front of, right behind the ball, in making a practice swing, or in the backswing. So the player still needs to be careful while addressing the ball and, ta and taking the backswing not to touch the sand. All right, next section, when touching the sand in the bunker does not result in a penalty. So this rule does not prohibit the player from touching the sand in other ways, including digging in with the feet, smoothing the bunker uh, to care for the course. But let's see a final paragraph for this one. Placing clubs or other objects in the bunker, measuring, marking, lifting, replacing, uh, leaning on a club, whether out of uh, boredom while waiting for your turn to play or to prevent falling, Striking the sand in frustration or anger. That is uh, now okay to do. I not that we're condoning doing things in frustration or anger, but there is no longer a penalty for that. Uh, but the next paragraph is important in, in that the player gets the general penalty if his or her actions in touching the sand improve the conditions affecting the stroke in breach of rule 8.1a. So in other words, that second bullet point of smoothing the bunker to care for the course does not always let the player, does not mean the player's carte blanche to 
uh, rake the entire bunker. You have to look at that in conjunction with Rule 8.1a and, the, and, what, and ask yourself, is the player improving any of the conditions affecting the stroke uh, by, by raking? Uh, next section, uh, no restrictions after the ball has been played out of the bunker. After a ball in a bunker is played and is outside the bunker, the player may touch the sand in the bunker without penalty, may smooth sand in the bunker to care for the course without penalty. And this is true even if the ball comes rest outside the hazard and the player is required or allowed to take stroke and distance relief back in the bunker or the sand in the bunker is on the player's line of play for the next stroke from outside the bunker. So let's go through those examples. The most common one of which is um, imagine a situation where a player's in a back greenside bunker and there's a penalty area in front of the green. The player hits the bunker shot thin, ball goes across the green into the penalty area. And let's say it's a yellow, yellow penalty area. So the player's uh, other, the player's relief options would be stroke and distance back in the bunker or back on line relief would send the player to the other side of the penalty area. So sometimes the player likes to take stroke and distance relief. This provision allows the player to rake the bunker before dropping in the bunker, even though the player knows full well that that's what he or she is going to do. A uh, second example is a little more uh, convoluted where let's say a player's ball is in a bunker, greenside bunker, the player hits the bunker shot thin, hits the lip of the bunker, comes to rest behind the bunker. So this allows the player to rake the bunker even though where the player is raking is now on the player's line of play and since the player now has just a short pitch shot to the green, you know, the player would be improving the line of play because there is the potential that the ball might come to rest in that bunker. A penalty for breach of this rule is the uh, general penalty. And then as a nice reminder under rule 12.3 that uh, you know when your ball is in a bunker you know certain relief rules still apply you know that you are allowed to take relief from certain things such as immovable obstruction may perhaps a drain uh, cover in a uh, bunker you could have a dangerous animal condition you could have a rattlesnake in the bunker next to your ball and rule 16 will tell us tell us how the player can proceed. And you could have an unplayable ball in the bunker. What if your ball is really buried in the sand or on a steep slope, something like that, and you decide that it's worth taking the penalty stroke uh, to take relief. In Rule 19, we'll talk about the options for that, including a, a new relief option for uh, 2019. All right, so any questions on Rule 12? Yes? You're in a bunker, you don't get out of the bunker. So you after your stroke, you're still in the bunker. Can you rate your initial spot because it's for the purpose of caring for the course? Okay, all right, all right, all right. That, that's a good and realistic question. The player's ball is, uh, probably happens too often than we would like. Um, player's ball is in a bunker. Player uh, leaves the ball in the bunker. So then it's a question of may the player rake the bunker before making her next stroke. And in this case, the player's hands are somewhat tied because the ball is still in the bunker. Uh, so the player may rake, but the player's not allowed to improve the conditions affecting that next stroke, that, that, that new stroke. So for example, if the player advanced the ball forward five feet, then the player could rake where she just played from because that's not one of the protected areas of, of, under Rule 8.1a. So she could rake that, but where she could run into problems would be, say, if she was in the front of the bunker, the ball hit the lip, came to rest behind her, but still in the bunker, because then the area she just played from would be on her line of play, for example. But in, in the normal situation where you've advanced the ball forward, uh, uh, th then, yeah, th then you could rake where you just played from, because that's not on your line of play, area of intent stance or swing, and so forth. And that's where knowing what the five conditions affecting the stroke would help mm -hmm. that person out. Yeah. All right. It, all, it also it concerns stance. Yeah, yes. That's one yeah. of the yeah. five yeah. conditions. Yeah. yeah, so conditions affecting the stroke are lie the ball, area of intended swing, area of intended stance, 
line of play and the uh, relief area where you're dropping. Now, uh, Rule 13 uh, covers putting greens, and we'll start with uh, several definitions. Uh, flag stick is a movable pole provided by the committee placed in the hole to show players where the hole is. It includes the flag and any other material or objects attached to it, such as to indicate the uh, hole location. There are certain requirements for the flag stick, and those are state in the equipment rules, which are on the uh, can be found on the USGA website. Hole is the finishing point on the putting green for the hole being played. It must be exactly four and a quarter inches in diameter and at least four inches in depth. If a lining is used, uh, the important point is the line must be sunk at least one inch. Uh, below the putting green surface. And then uh, here's something that uh, I'm sure our friend Dan appreciates. Uh, the word hole, when not used as a definition in italics, is used throughout the rules to mean the part of the course associated with a particular teen area, putting green, and hole. So, in other words, when we talk about the ninth hole, uh, we're not talking about just that hole and a quarter inch hole in the ground. We're talking about the ninth hole in general. Hold right, at, right after this. Uh, when a ball is at rest in the hole after a stroke and the entire ball is below the surface of the putting green. Uh, when the, we were talking about holding out or hold out, it means the ball is in the hole or it means the ball is hold. And then for a special case, which involves a change in the rules for ball resting against the flag stick in the hole, uh, rule 13.2C will tell us uh, the status of that ball. Uh, next definition is putting green. Is the area of the hole the player's playing that's specially prepared for putting or the committee is defined, such as if there's a temporary putting green in use. The putting green contains the hole into which the player tries to play the ball. The putting green is one of the five defined areas of the course. Now the putting greens for other holes are wrong greens and are part of the general area. The edge of a putting green is defined by where it can be seen that the specially prepared area starts, such as where you have a change in the uh, mowing heights, and thus the committee defines the edge in a different way. You know, sometimes, you know, you see courses with fringes that are very, very, they're cut very closely, and sometimes it's hard to tell where the edge of the putting green is, so sometimes uh, the committee will actually put a series of white dots on the ground uh, defining the edge of the putting green. So if a double green is used for two different holes, uh, you know, think about the one for the two 18th holes on the River and Meadow Valleys courses at Black Wolf Run. Uh, the entire prepared area containing both holes is treated as the putting green when playing each hole. So if on playing 18 on the river course, you hit your ball six, on the same putting green, but 60 yards behind beyond uh, the hole for the river course, you're still on the putting green. Um, but uh, the committee uh, certainly could define an edge that divides the double green into two uh, so that if you're on the wrong side, you are in fact on a wrong green, meaning you have to take relief. And generally a committee would do that only in a situation where, you know, imagine you have say a horseshoe shaped green where the committee is concerned that if a player's on the wrong side, the player's gonna take out a wedge and take a big chunk out of the green. But it, a green, but otherwise a big, uh, you know, green like at Black Wolf Run, where there isn't quite that concern, you know, it's usually much simpler just to leave it as one big putting green. Which leads us to our last definition for wrong green. And that is any green on the course other than the putting green, the hole is for the hole the player is playing. The wrong green includes the putting greens for all other holes that the player is not playing. Uh, that includes the normal putting green for a hole where temporary greens being used and all practice greens. So let's say I'm playing the sixth hole 
then the seventh hole, the put putting green for the seventh hole is the wrong green. The practice green, putting green is the wrong green. The short, the green, putting green, the short game area is a wrong green. And the significance of that, as we'll see, is that I'm not allowed to play from those. That I have to take relief off of them. And then the last uh, sentence is helpful. Wrong greens are part of the general area. Why is that helpful? Uh, mainly because that has a way of making its way on rules exams. So now let's look at uh, rule 13 itself. Rule 13 is a specific rule for putting greens. Um, uh, putting greens are specially prepared now, for playing the ball along the ground, and there's a flag stick for the hole for each putting green, so certain different rules apply than for other areas of the course. And then that's a good point to be made here that, uh, you know, in the putting green, we're anticipating and expecting the ball to be played along the ground. Rule 13.1 uh, actions allowed or required. Uh, purpose statement. This rule allows the players to do things on the putting green that are not normally allowed off the putting green, such as lifting, cleaning, and replacing the ball, repairing certain damage, removing sand and loose soil. Rule 13.1a, when is a ball on the putting green? When any part of the ball touches the putting green or lies on or in anything and is inside the edge of the putting green. So uh, somewhat similar to a uh, bunker, that the ball has to either touch the putting green surface itself or be inside the edge of the putting green and on something, for example, on a piece of paper or something like that. Uh, then the ball is considered to be on the uh, putting green. And that you know, can be important. I mean, that's, it's amazing during the course of a season how often as a rules official you're called over by a player whose ball is just on the edge and the player wants to confirm whether he or she is on the putting green. Uh, and sometimes it can be a close call, but it's an important call uh, because why? Because if the ball is on the putting green, the player can lift and clean the ball. And that's, uh, that's a big deal to the players. If part of the ball is both on the putting green and in another area of the course, then we look at the hierarchy under rule 2.2C. Uh, 13.1B, ball on the putting green may be lifted and cleaned, but uh, the player needs to remember to mark the spot of the ball before lifting it, and the player needs to remember to replace the ball uh, on the original spot. And that's uh, important to remember, especially if a player has been asked to move the ball marker over a uh, putter head length or two. The player needs to remember to uh, uh, repeat that process to replace the ball. Uh, 13.1c, improvements allowed on the putting green. And this rule has been expanded a good bit for 2019. So during the round, and while play's been stopped, player may take these actions. And the next part is important. No matter whether the ball is on or off the putting green. So, uh, you know, we'll see with certain rules that the location of the ball dictates what the player may or may not do. But in this case, what dictates what the player may or may not do is what the item is that the, or what the action is that the player wants to do. And that is that if it's on the putting green, even if the player's ball is not on the putting green, the player may uh, perform these acts. But first is removal of sand and loose soil. Uh, ordinarily, uh, you, know, you know, say in the general area, the player's not allowed to remove sand or loose soil if that would improve the conditions affecting the stroke. But if that sand and loose soil are on the putting green, the player may then remove them. Uh, the player is allowed to repair damage on the putting green. But we need to, well, let's walk through this carefully because this is uh, new. Player may repair damage without penalty by taking reasonable actions to restore the putting green. So it's damage, and the player is restoring the putting green to what it was beforehand. The player's not improving the green to beyond what it was before the damage occurred. But only 
by using his or her hand, foot, or other body part, or a normal ball mark repair tool, T club, or similar uh, piece of equipment, and without unduly delaying play, meaning that, uh, say, if you're playing in a competition where uh, metal spikes are allowed, if the player is looking to tap down 2,000 metal spikes on the line of play, there could be a pace of play, a uh, delay of play issues with that. But if the player improves the putting green by taking actions that exceed what's reasonable, underline reasonable to restore the putting green to its original condition, the player, player <coughs> gets the general penalty. With an example being the player doing more than just repairing the damage, but is actually creating a pathway or by using an object not allowed. So what is, what is meant by damage on the putting green? It's any damage that's been caused by a person or an outside influence. And we have uh, several examples. Uh, ball marks, shoe damage, which would include spike marks, would include heel marks. Uh, scrapes or indentations caused by equipment or a flag stick, such as perhaps a caddy in a previous group who was leaning on a flag stick, digging it into the ground, or a flag stick that damaged the hole while it was being replaced. Old hole plugs, uh, turf plugs, uh, sod seams, and scrapes or indentations from maintenance tools or vehicles, animal tracks or hoof, hoof indentations. And, you know, especially here in Wisconsin, that's useful where, you know, occasionally we do come across deer tracks across a putting green and this rule now just simply says that the player on his or her own may repair uh, those tracks. You know, does, and the player no longer needs to have the uh, uh, committee involved with that. Or any uh, in, indentations left by an embedded object such as an acorn. Uh, but damage on the putting green does not include uh, damage or conditions that result from the following. Normal practices for maintaining the condition of the putting green, such as aeration holes. So if you're playing on a course with recently aerated greens, there's probably going to be a local rule in effect allowing relief if your ball winds up in an aeration hole, but you're not allowed to repair the 200 aeration holes between your ball and the hole. Uh, anything that, that was the result of irrigation or rain or natural forces may not repair slash restore. And any natural surface uh, imperfections, whether weeds or bare areas, um, and that unless, say, a bare area was also, also contains, for example, shoe damage, uh, you may not repair it. Or, or simple natural wear of the hole which is different than actual damage to the edge of the hole from, say, a flag stick being replaced, which is something that could be uh, repaired. So, you know, so this was a change that got a lot of attention for this year. And, I mean, Bill, what's your thought as to how things went with WSGA? I think people year? love it. I mean, the damage that you would in the past have thought unfair to not fix, you can now fix. I have you know there were people worried that people would create the pathway to the hall i haven't ever seen that um i think it's terrific i really do I, and i know at milwaukee country club when the mid-am was there they had the acorn issue on the ninth green which we'll no longer have to really worry about so i think it's terrific okay all right uh rule 13 yes john Thirteen one seven first sentence there. Is, is that somewhat misleading? Uh, it says during a round and while play is stopped. Should that be more or when play is stopped? You're allowed to do these things? Oh um oh so the question is with the first sentence rule thirteen point one C, why does it say during a round and while play is stopped? Player may take these actions. Why is it and rather than or? Um, you know, it's, well, let's see. Where's another rule that uh, uses that construction? Um, 
even though plan stopped, you're still in the middle of the plan. Yeah, yeah and, I think, and I think it might not matter that much which word is used, because it does apply to both. And maybe it would, by using and, it makes it clear that it doesn't apply only to one or the other, that it does apply to both, even though but I think your point is, from a player's perspective, only one of those two situations can occur, right? So, but I think there, there, if if you used or, there might be the potential that some might read more into that than they think. Then, yeah, then, then, so, so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then, I, I, I think there could be the potential that some might say, "Well, you have to decide, or you could do this during the round, or uh, while play's been stopped, you can't do it both." I think a more common misconception is that your ball has to be on the green for you to take those actions and that's not true yeah yeah i was just looking for example under 8.1 it does use the same construction this rule applies to actions taken both during a round and while play is stopped um yeah. i don't know john i hadn't thought about that but i think you could make a case either way and All right, uh, rule 13.1D. Uh, Dan touched on part of this earlier, and this has uh, one of the bigger changes for 2019. Uh, there are two specific rules for ball or ball marker that moves on the putting green. Uh, section one, no penalty for accidentally causing the ball to move. There's no penalty if the player, opponent, or another player in stroke play accidentally moves the player's ball or ball marker on the putting green. Player must replace the ball on its original spot or place a ball marker on that spot. Exception to that is if the ball uh, moves, starts to move during the backswing or the stroke and the stroke is made, in which case the player simply plays the ball as it lies. All right, so let's look at this. For the first and perhaps most important point is that there's no penalty if this uh, movement occurs on the putting green. So it applies only to a ball line on the putting green. Secondly, is this applies only to accidental movements on the putting green. So let's uh, take an example where, you know, Dan used the example of Dustin Johnson at the U.S. Open, but that was, uh, you know, partly the question was, uh, whether he caused the ball to move. And under the current rules, would we say he's 95% certain that his actions caused the ball to move? You know, probably not. But let's take a more uh, black and white case where a player's a ball lies on the putting green, he's taking some practice swings next to the ball and accidentally hits the ball. So we know that player's not considered to have made a stroke since he didn't intend to strike the ball, but he did move his ball in play. Did he move it accidentally or deliberately? Moved it accidentally and on the putting green. So now this provision applies. And this provision will tell, will tell us that one, there's no penalty, and two, the player has to replace the ball. If the player were to do that in the fairway though, what would the uh, ruling be? It would be a one stroke penalty for moving the ball in play and then replace the ball. So different result because it's on the putting green. So two requirements on the putting green, and it was accidental. Now, if the, um, and Dan touched about uh, if the player or opponent deliberately lifts the player's ball or ball mark on the putting green, then rule nine tells us what to do there. Now, second part, uh, if natural forces, and remember that definition, uh, wind, water or gravity cause a player's ball on the putting green to move where the player must play from next depends on whether the ball had already been lifted and replaced on its original spot so if the ball was on the putting green and wind moves the ball first is there any penalty no there's no penalty but we have to decide where the player is going to play the next stroke from and that's going to depend as to whether the player had lifted and replaced the ball if the ball had already been lifted and replaced, then the ball must be replaced on its original spot, even though it was moved by natural forces. So let's have 
and we'll, we'll go through the next provision, then we'll go through two examples. If the ball had not already been lifted and replaced, then the ball must be played from its new spot. So let's go through two variations using Dan's favorite hole, 13 at Oconomowoc, where, by the way, some of us once saw Dan put off the green <laughs> down the hill. <laughs> that um, Let's say Dan hits his approach shot up onto the green, and while he's walking up there, he still isn't, hasn't gotten within 20 yards of the ball. A gust of wind from behind the green blows the ball off the green and down the hill. Now, in that case, what's the ruling? No penalty. Play the ball where it winds up at the bottom of the hill. Now, second situation. Dan hits up onto the green. He walks up onto the green, marks the spot of the ball, lifts it, replaces it. And while he's surveying his putt, the wind now blows the ball off the green down the hill. Now what will he, he do in that case? In that case, no penalty again, because natural forces cause the ball to move. But now, because of this provision, he's going to replace the ball to where he had uh, marked and lifted it originally. So the difference between those two situations with two very different results is that in one case, the player had not uh, marked, lifted, and replaced the ball. In the other, in the second situation, the player had Mark lifted and replaced the ball. And that will depend as to, that will affect what the player will do. The, the US, if it helps uh, remember this, the USGA likes to use the expression of once the players who lifted the ball from the putting green, the player owns that spot. And that's where the player uh, would uh, return with the ball if, even if natural forces uh, moved it. All right, uh, rule 13.1E no deliberate testing of greens. Okay, all right, John, here we go again. During a round and while play is stopped. I think that's gonna follow us around. Um, a player must not deliberately take either of these actions to test the putting green or wrong green. So it's a very narrow definition of what testing the green means. That is to rub the surface or to roll a ball. So just placing your hand on the surface and not rubbing it, that's not considered testing the surface. So rubbing the surface or rolling the ball, uh, that is prohibited uh, during the round or while play has been suspended. A player may not do that, but then there's an exception that is between the play of two holes, players allowed to do that on the previous putting green or a practice green. Uh, and that's a necessary exception because the player is allowed to make practice strokes there. And so therefore, if you're gonna let the player make practice strokes, you might you need to let the player roll a ball or rough the surface as well. Uh, the penalty for testing the putting green uh, or, or a wrong green is the uh, general penalty. 13.1F, uh, we went over the definition of a wrong green. This rule will tell us uh, what the player is required to do if the player has interference from a wrong green. So we'll start by defining what interference is considered to be. And that is that interference under this rule, with emphasis under this uh, rule, exists when any part of the ball touches the wrong green or lies on or in anything uh, that's inside the edge of the wrong green, such as on a piece of paper on the putting green, uh, or the wrong green physically interferes with the player's area of intended stance or area of intended swing. And this uh, second bullet point is new for 2019. So the player has interference if the ball is on the wrong green, if the player's stance would be on the wrong green, or if the wrong green would interfere with the area of intended swing. For example, if the player's club on the follow through would strike the wrong green, the player has uh, interference. Now the rule goes on to say when there is interference by wrong green, the player must not play the ball as it lies and the player must take free relief. So this is a requirement and uh, 
And why is that a requirement? It's just to protect our putting greens, to, uh, to make sure there aren't uh, big divots uh, taken out, out of them. So the player must take free relief by dropping the original ball or another ball uh, with the reference point is the nearest point of complete relief. It's in the same area of the course where the ball came to rest, which uh, in the great majority of cases will be the general area. Uh, the relief area will be one club length, but must be in the same area of the course as the reference point. Uh, must not be near the hole in the reference point and must provide complete relief. So for lie, stance, and area of intended swing. So uh, if you look at that illustration on the opposite page, it shows a player whose ball lies on the wrong putting green. When the player takes relief, the player has to remember uh, her stance. Uh, so we see the stance is off the wrong green, the uh, ball itself is off the wrong green, and the area of intended swing is, is not interfered by it the player will drop within a club length there. Now, goes, the next section does provide that there's no relief if interference exists only because the player chooses a club type of stance or swing or direction that is clearly unreasonable in the circumstances. So for example, imagine, um, you know, with thick U.S. Open rough round putting green, uh, the player's balls in the thick rough, and he says, you know, if I take an extra, extra, extra wide stance, I can just get my ball on the wrong putting green, and maybe then I can wind up dropping on the fringe so I don't have to play out of this thick rough. Then that player is not able to take relief because, you know, in that case, the stance the player was taking that gave him uh, interference was clearly unreasonable in the circumstances. Now, the penalty uh, for playing... Uh, uh, for breach is the general penalty and believe it or not this does happen over the years there have been uh, I think a few instances of tour players who have played from a wrong putting green who simply didn't know better uh, and one happened just a year or two ago uh, in New Jersey at, uh, um, at one of the FedEx Cup playoff events where you know player thought as well I just hit a wild shot this is my lucky day I've got a great lie on this other green and they played from there and they are penalized. So and again, match play, straightforward. Player loses the hole. And stroke play, remember the stroke the player plays from the wrong green does count, and the player will add two penalty strokes uh, uh, to that. All right, uh, next uh, section talks about the flag stick, which is located on the uh, putting green. And it's you know interesting how you know, an object that's, you know, seems so straightforward, you know, still needs, you know, four or so pages of rules to address what the player may and may not uh, do. And, and the reason for that is the player has uh, certain special rights uh, with the flag stick. A uh, player has several options, leave the flag stick in the hole or have it removed, have it attended. But whatever the player wants, the player needs to decide before making the stroke. And then the last sentence of the purpose statement uh, that it's a change for 2019 is there is normally no penalty if the ball in motion hits the flag stick. And right underneath that helpful reminder, this rule applies to a ball played from anywhere on the course, not just for balls played from the putting green, but from anywhere on the course. 13.2A1, uh, the uh, player may leave the flag stick in the hole. The uh, player may make a stroke with the flag stick left in the hole, so it's possible for the ball in motion to hit it. The player must decide before the stroke, either by leaving it in the hole or if it had been removed by putting it back in the hole. In either case, the player must not gain an advantage by deliberately moving the flag stick to a position other than centered. So, for example, leaning away from the player. If the player were to do so and the ball then hits the flag stick, the player will get the general penalty. But if the player, so what would the ruling be if the player puts the flag stick in the hole in a way, in a position that's not centered for the purpose of helping the player, but then the ball does not strike the flag stick? 
what would the ruling be? Then there's no penalty. So that would fall into that no harm, no foul uh, category. Uh, second section, player makes a stroke with the flag stick left in the hole and the ball hits the flag stick. There's no penalty and the ball is played as it lies. So this was you know, one of the uh, perhaps two most visible changes in the rules for 2019 that there's no longer a penalty if a putt strikes an unattended flag stick. And, you know, now that we're a year into the new rules, I'm just curious, what was everyone's experience in 2019 uh, with that? Was it much of an issue? Did it help pace of play, hurt pace of play? Um, any comments? Yeah, Lee. It's interesting but with both girls and boys golf. I think it's really helped the girls game quite a bit, keeping the flags in the hole for pace of play. Um, What's interesting as the year went on with boys golf, it seemed like more and more of the coaches wanted the flag stick out. They saw it as an as not a as good a way to putt, not necessarily for pace of play purposes, but they they saw that you know when we were talking about champ, you know Bryson with his theory and all these theories about the flag and that, it seemed like more coaches. I thought we would go the other way with it. But it seems like more and more coaches are saying it really should be up. But we had to get to the point where, and I think maybe this year we'll address it even more. If we're going to leave it in, let's leave it in as a whole group. Although you don't have to do that. It's just ways that we're trying to figure out how to how to deal with that. And then, Bill, you'll be a big part of that decision, I'm sure. How we can do if I'm not mistaken, and I was definitely not part of this decision. Um, didn't the WIA adopt a local rule that during the state high school girls tournament that if the flag stick was taken out by player A, that player B and C was stuck with that flag stick being out? I don't know. Really? I don't know. Nobody has specific, but it sure sounds right. <laughs> I, I was told that, and I want to make it perfectly clear that I was in <laughs> no way, shape, or form part of that. Which, if the head of the tournament says it's the case, that sounds to me like a local rule. <laughs> I, I think Lee's comment's interesting, but it seemed like only to me that just with golf and television, that you saw a lot more people putting with the flag stick in the yeah. hole early, early in the season than you did late in the season. Is that how most people's perception? But in, ter in terms of for daily play, you know, I think, you know, a lot of people, in my sense is a lot of people settled into the routine of either never <laughs> removing the flag stick or never removing the flag stick till they get within 10, 15 feet of the hole or so, so yeah. something like, like that. Um, but I uh, Bill, any issues or observations from WSGA events? I, you say? I love it. I, I hope it continues. I certainly want to be a part of that decision with regard to whether you can leave it in because you can't make a local rule denying the rights of a player granted in the rules of golf. Uh, which I found interesting, but that's neither here nor there. Okay. All right. All right. Well, 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 thank you all. That's uh, interesting to hear. And it's good to know that it's not quite the Armageddon that some people were talking about 12 months ago. <laughs> yeah. And I think in general, the rule is accomplishing what it was intended to accomplish. Uh, next section, uh, 10 to a 3, limitation on the player moving or removing the flag stick while the ball's in motion. So if the a stroke was made with the flag stick in the hole, the player or his caddy must not deliberately move or remove the flag stick to affect where the ball might come to rest. If this is done, the player gets the general penalty, but there's no penalty if the flag stick was moved or removed for any other reason such as when he or she reasonably believes the ball will not hit the flag stick before coming to rest, such as, you know, if it's clear the ball is going to stop well short of the hole or it's going beyond the hole and it's not going to return the hole and the flag stick is removed while that ball is in motion, there would be no penalty. Now, 
next section deals with what happens if another player does this. So when the player has left the flag stick in the hole and has not authorized anyone to attend the flag stick, another player must not deliberately move or remove the flag stick for the purpose of affecting where the ball in motion might come to rest. Uh, if another player does so uh, before or during the stroke and the player makes the stroke without being aware of this or does so while the ball is in motion, which is the more likely situation, that other player, the one who removed the flag stick, gets the general penalty. But there's no penalty if the other player or his or her caddy moves or removes the flag stick for any other reason, such as reasonably believing the ball will not hit the flag stick or is not aware the player is about to play or the player's ball is, is in motion. You know, and all that uh, makes sense that if I want the flag stick to remain in the hole, I, I should be entitled to have that. No, nobody should be able to uh, change that. Rule 13.2b, uh, removing the flag stick from the hole. The player may make a stroke with the flag stick removed from the hole, so the ball will not hit the flag stick. The player needs to decide this before the stroke by either having the flag stick removed or by having someone attend the flag stick. And the player is treated as having authorized the flag stick to be attended if the caddy is holding the flag stick or standing right next to the hole because of that relationship between the player and the caddy, or if the player asks someone else to attend the flag stick and that person does so, or the player sees another person holding the flag stick and uh, does not object to that, does not ask that person to move away or to leave the flag stick in the hole. So now, what happens if the ball hits the flag stick or the person attending it? If the ball hits the flag stick that the player decided to have removed or hits the person attending the flag stick, what happens depends as to whether uh, that was accidental or deliberate. And we've seen that distinction uh, before. We saw that distinction under Rule 11, for example. If the ball accidentally hits the flag stick or the person attending it, um, there's no penalty and the ball is played as it lies. So you could have a case where I'm attending the flag stick for Bill and I'm trying to remove the flag stick once Bill's ball is in motion, but the flag stick's stuck in the hole and I simply can't get out of the hole in time. So I didn't mean for the ball to strike the flag stick. So that would be considered accidental. So no penalty, either one of us, the ball is played as it lies. Or it could be a situation where Bill putts and I just zone out. I'm watching, or I'm watching another hole. And I, I'm not aware that Bill's ball is in motion. And I simply fail to remove the flag stick. And no penalty. And the ball is uh, uh, played as it lies. If the ball is deliberately deflected or stopped by the person attending the flag stick, then it's going to be a different uh, matter. Because in that case, Rule 11.2c applies, which defer, uh, refers to deliberate deflections. Uh, the uh, player must not play the ball as it lies, and instead must take relief under Rule 11.2c, and that person gets the general penalty under Rule 11.2. All right, so for the purposes of this rule, deliberately deflected or stopped means the same thing as under Rule 11.2a, meaning you deliberately do that or you leave an object there uh, for that purpose. Um, includes when the player's ball in motion hits a removed flag stick that was deliberately positioned or left in a particular place on the ground so it might deflect or stop a ball. So for example, if you know, the holes on the front part of the green, you have a steep downhill putt towards it and there's water beyond. And if you carefully put the flag stick on the ground beyond the hole, between the hole and the water, uh, and the ball strikes the flag stick, you're going to be penalized. Right? With, with an attended flag stick, if the person deliberately failed to remove it, um, that, that's considered to be deliberately deflected or stopped. Or, that, or when the person attending to remove the flag stick uh, failed to move out of the way. So if I see Bill's ball 
coming right towards my foot. And, and I think to myself, gosh, Bill's ball is going to hit my foot, but I'm going to leave my foot there because if Bill's ball doesn't strike it, his ball is going to go probably 20 feet beyond the hole. Then I'm considered to have deliberately deflected Bill's ball, even though my only action was actually an inaction, that of uh, not moving my uh, foot. All right, uh, 13 point, but remember, on, uh, with the exception on rule 11.3, there uh, were certain things that a player may do. Uh, for example, a player may move, uh, move a removed flag stick while the ball is in motion. 13.2C, um, we alluded to this in definitions uh, earlier, and this is a change uh, for this year, or for last year. If a player's ball comes to rest against the flag stick in the hole, if any part of the ball is in the hole below the surface of the putting green, the ball is treated as whole, even if the entire ball is not below the surface. And that is a change. So if just part of the ball is below the surface, uh, the ball is considered uh, to be whole. But if no part of the ball is in the hole below the surface, then the ball is not whole. Then the player can remove the flag stick and if the ball moves, which seems extremely likely, there's no penalty and the ball must be replaced on the lip of the hole. So even if the ball falls into the hole, that does not count as hold. The ball must be replaced on the lip. So that is a, a change uh, for this year. And with that, keep in mind this final sentence, which is a useful reminder, Rule 3.3c, and the requirement to hole out in a stroke play that if the ball is somehow against the flag stick with none of the ball in the hole below the level of the green, and the player mistakenly believes the ball is whole, and the player just picks up the ball, goes on, tees off on the next hole, in stroke play, that player uh, would be disqualified for failing to hole out. All right, uh, rule 13.3, uh, a very specific rule that applies to a very narrow uh, set of uh, circumstances. That is when the ball is overhanging uh, the lip of the hole. This does not apply anywhere else. Uh, so if the ball is one inch away from the hole, this rule does not apply. If any part of the player's ball overhangs the lip of the hole, the player is allowed a reasonable time to reach the hole and 10 more seconds to wait to see whether the ball will fall into the hole. So this, so there are two elements uh, that are in there, um, and that's necessary as to how much time is allowed for the ball to fall into the hole. A reasonable amount of time to reach the hole, and that's going to vary. That you know, for example, you could have a five iron approach shot that comes to rest overhanging the lip of the hole, but it might take the player several minutes to get up to the hole. But and, you know, versus you know, a player who has a ten foot putt. Who's, and the ball comes to rest overhang the lip of the hole and get to the hole in just a couple of seconds. But once either player reaches the hole, uh, player will have uh, 10 more seconds to see whether the ball will fall into the hole. If the ball falls into the hole in this waiting time, i.e. during the reasonable amount of time to reach the hole or during the 10 seconds after reaching the hole, then the players hold out with the previous stroke. And the player is very happy. Uh, if the ball does not fall into the hole during that time, i.e., if at the end of that 10 second waiting period the ball is not falling in, then the ball is treated as being at rest. Now, why is it important to say that ball is at rest? Because what happens then if a player goes to tap in that ball and the ball moves and the, and the player makes a stroke at a moving ball? Is the player going to be penalized for playing a moving ball? The answer is no, is this protects the player. This protects the player by saying, regardless of what your eyes tell you, this under the rules, this ball is at rest, so there's no penalty for playing a moving ball. So that's a very, a very player-friendly provision. Um, if the ball falls into the hole uh, after that 10-second period and before it's played, the player has hold out with the previous stroke, but the player gets one penalty stroke added to the score. Uh, for the hole. So 
you know, what does that mean? That means that after the 10 seconds, there is no incentive for the player to wait anymore, any longer. That whether the player taps in or the ball falls in, the result result's going to be the same. The player's going to add one to the score for the hole. So, uh, so that's good. So that encourages the player just to go ahead and tap it in and not wait in, any longer. Rule 13.3b. Uh, what to do if the ball overhanging the hole is lifted or moved before that waiting time has ended. Well, if that happens, the ball is treated as having come to rest uh, and the ball must be replaced on the lip of the hole and the waiting time no longer applies. So if the player were to do that, the players, you know, kind of shot himself in the foot uh, and that would be uh, the ruling. But if an opponent in match play or another player in stroke play deliberately lifts or moves the player's ball overhanging the hole before the end of that waiting time, in match play, the ball is treated as hold, and there's no penalty to the other player. Thinking is that that was the best possible result at the time, and the uh, player gets the benefit of that. In stroke play, though, you can't make the assumption that the ball would have fallen into the hole because the number of other players involved. Uh, but what we can do in stroke play is penalize the player who lifted it. Uh, and that player will get the general penalty and the player uh, will replace the ball and lip of the hole. So in stroke play, the, per the player who did this uh, uh, is penalized. You know, and it's penalized because that player has potentially uh, deprived as deprived this player of her rights to see if the ball would fall in and has potentially added one stroke to this player's score. So it therefore it makes sense for there to be a penalty for this other player and the player does get a bad deal. The player has to replace the ball and lift the hole and uh, tap in uh, in that case. So the player gets a bad deal but the rules can't make the assumption that the ball would have fallen in had this other person not lifted or moved it. So, so that is rule 13. A lot, a lot going on there, but you know, that, that makes sense. The putting green is the place where we all wind up at the end of each hole. It's a specially prepared surface. It has a flag stick. Flag stick has certain rights with us. Certain things can happen, uh, can happen there. Uh, any questions on rule 13? I ran into one on the rule quiz last night. Okay. Holding so it sounds like you were doing your homework last yeah, night. I am. Like tending, uh, my caddy's tending the flag stick. I put the ball, the ball's in motion. I pull the flag, the cup comes out with it, the ball rolls up to the cup, hits it, and does not go in. Okay. Flag right. is alive. All right. In that case, I'm actually going to defer and let Bill cover that because that's on one of the sample questions that Bill's going to go over with, oh. the, with, the, with, the, with the variation okay. depend, that depends as to where that stroke was made from. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a, that's a very good and timely question. Yeah. I got two questions. One, one that's not as important, so I'll go with the most important one first. <laughs> that rule talking about the flag stick either being removed or left in. What if the flag stick has been removed? I'm the player, I want the flag stick out. It's on the ground. I hit a putt, 50 footer, small server. Somebody else then grabs the flag stick without me wanting them to do that and puts the flag stick into the hole and the ball then hits the flag stick. Okay, so, so originally the flag stick was out of the hole? It was removed at the player's request. But, okay. the, but someone else picks up the flag stick and puts the ball into the hole while the ball is still moving and the ball then strikes the flag stick. Okay, so the, the question is when the player putted, the flag stick had been removed from the hole, set, set aside. And for some reason, while the ball is in motion, another player grabs the flag stick from the ground, runs over, sticks it in the hole, and the ball strikes the flag stick. Okay, well, in that case, I think we can say that that other person has deliberately deflected this ball in motion in, in, in that situation. So we'd have to determine whether it was deliberate or accidental. I mean, maybe well, maybe I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, and I, I suppose you could have a case where the person is completely unaware of what you're doing and is just thinking, oh, well, for my shot, I want the flag stick in the hole. I'm going to go put it in the hole. You know? Yeah, so I mean, you could you could have, I suppose, the situation where 
you know, you need to determine whether it's deliberate or accidental when you look at the uh, results or the specifics of each situation. Okay. All right. Well, all right. Well, let's let's go through that. What what would be the ruling? Let's say the case where Lee putts with the flag stick out of the hole, and while the ball's in, he putts, and I say, "Oh my gosh, he hit that so hard! That ball's gonna go off the green." I'm going to be a nice guy. I'm going to go put the flag stick back in the hole because then if the ball strikes the flag stick, it's going to stay on the green. All right. So in that case, what have I done? I've deliberately uh, uh, deflected that. Okay. So in that case, we know that what, what happens to me? Uh, I'm penalized two strokes. All right. And Lee incurs no penalty in that case. Right. But where is Lee? What's Lee going to do with his next stroke? Uh, that's right. Well, well, what, what do we say under Rule 11 there? If the stroke was made from the putting green, it was deliberately deflected. You, the stroke doesn't count, and you replay it. This is all I think if you don't replay it, that he gets DQ. <laughs> well, that, <laughs> that, I think there needs to be some clarification on that rule about canceling that stroke. Because let's say that it did hit the stick okay. and drive it. Okay. In. And then he walks and hits off to the next yeah. tee. He he is the okay. Two. Yeah, yeah. However, there was a ruling in the PGA uh, tournament where, and I forget who the pro was. He missed his putt. He was like a six inches from eight inches from there. He tried to tap it in, missed, hit his foot, and it went in the hole. Yes, picked Ooh. up the ball. Yes, Jesper Parnick went to the next hole, teed off. The ruling was he got two strokes added because he played from a wrong place. All right, well, let's go to the example where when I stuck the flag stick in the hole with Lee's putt, Lee's, Lee's ball strikes the flag stick, goes in the hole, and he says, oh, my gosh, what a great break. You know, thanks, John. Lee picks up his ball, goes to the next hole, and tees off. In stroke play, what's the ruling? He's disqualified, right? Yeah, because he, yeah. he didn't hold out on that hole. But, uh, you know, as Dan has said, you know, it's very clear that, you know, in the, in the language of the rules, very clear when it says the stroke does not count. So uh, that never hold out in that case. Does he, does he have in that case is a movable obstruction, right, Bill? So what? You think of the play stroke as a movable obstruction in that 11 2 yes. stroke does not count scenario. Yeah. John, does he have the option of going back and correcting that before he turns in his scorecard, before the round is Well, if it's he, he has the ball. ability to uh, replay the stroke as required before he tees he's off on the next hole. The next but once he yeah, tees yeah. off on the next hole, he's completely he, he's, he, it's too late to, to correct that mistake. But now let's look at the other yeah, situation yeah, where... Jasper yeah. Perman yeah. did not actually pull out. What, what happened was he, he went to tap in, Hit his foot and it didn't go in. Okay, all right. Well, so then he, he putted from where it was into the hole. Okay, all right. Well, uh, that's and you said it was yes, we're part of it. Yeah. All right, I'm not not familiar with it, but the player has a let's say a short putt, and it what horseshoes yeah. around the hole, comes back and strikes the player's foot. Yeah. All right, so at that moment, what would the correct ruling have been? Replay the stroke. That's Painful right. Replay. To, to replay the stroke under what rule? It would be I'm exception two question. to rule 11.1b. Uh, when yeah. a ball played from the putting green accidentally hits any person, you know, because that was an accidental deflection. And since this was from the putting green, even though it was the player himself, there's no penalty and the player was required to replay the stroke. So instead, he played from where that ball had come to rest and tapped in and finished on. So by playing from where that ball had come to rest, what did that player do? Played from, played wrong from a wrong place. Exactly. And you, and you said he was penalized two strokes for playing from the wrong place. Plus, plus they didn't count the stroke because it was canceled. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. And, 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 I thought that was well, yeah, and, and, and that's, you know, and let, let's talk about this. Because this is a good, a good sample, you know, quiz question that you know if it said if it if it tells you the player does this and it asks you what's the player's score for the hole you know as dan and bill have said you know very very helpful to make two columns strokes made and more importantly strokes that count <laughs> 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 and then penalty strokes incurred so 
the strokes that count, the player does not count that first putt, the first stroke that hit hit him because the rules the exception says that stroke doesn't count. But the player does count that next stroke from the wrong place. Then the player will add two penalty strokes for having played for, from the wrong place. But where, where I find it a little dicey is, you know, when, when, when we're playing in, in a rain delay situation and then there's worms all over the, if your ball, you're putting a ball and it hits a worm, that's considered a, a, a replay, cancel a replay. Well, yeah, yeah, and then that, that's, that, that's a very good point. Let's talk about that for a minute here. And, and I apologize for those online. We're backing up to exception two under rule 11.1b. And that is, you know, that, uh, if a player putts and the ball strikes a worm, this exception applies, which means this doesn't apply and the player uh, must play again. But one thing that's important, and it's in these clarifications that the USGA issued, and should uh, under that 11.1b, is it states that exception two to rule 11.1b is to be applied using the known or virtually certain standard, yeah. which is, player friendly in that, for example, so that means if you putt, and you see your ball strike a worm, then you're on the hook. You That stroke doesn't count. You have to replay it. Um, but on the other hand, if you putt and you don't see that it's an insect or, or worm or what have you, but let's say tele, uh, zoomed in television replay shows that in fact it happened. If that was not known or virtually certain at the time, then you're off the hook. Uh, with which that actually happened with an ant, and you could only tell when they zoomed in. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's uh, so that, that's an important uh, distinction there, and one that really helps protect the players. So, cool. all right. Well, before Bill goes over this uh, quest sample questions, any uh, other questions on thirteen? Yeah. The last thing is the brand new clarification about attachments that can go below the surface of the putting green. What, what significance does that have? Okay, I mean, the question is there is a new, uh, uh, let's see, oh no, it's under flag stick. A new clarification that's, uh, I think, under the definition of flag stick that states the specification of flag stick and the equipment rules was amended on uh, January 1st to include the following attachments may be permitted more than three inches below the putting green surface and must be constrained <laughs> to this area. Um, you're right. When you read that on the surface, you would think, what in the world? But imagine a case, and it goes hand in hand with the new, um, with the ability to putt with flag stick in the hole, is, you know, imagine those little cups at the bottom of putting green flag sticks, you know, where you can just yank the flag stick out and it brings the ball up with it. That if for some reason, you know, a course wants to install those on the regular flag sticks, it, it could. You know, so, so for, for, for example, if all the, you know, because uh, there's some people have speculated whether putting with a flag stick in the hole and retrieving the ball from the hole with a flag stick in it is causing additional wear and tear around the edge of the green. And some people thought, well, if we just put a little cup at the bottom, just like on the practice greens, then it makes it easier. So if people can figure out a good way to do that, uh, that's okay. Obviously, there's some concern that then if you have that bucket, or for lack of a better term, attached to the bottom, and then you put the flag stick on the ground, is that going to damage the green when you put it on the ground? So, And so, that wouldn't be considered the whole liner. It would be part of the flag stick, right? Yeah, yeah, correct. Which will address Jim's question. All right. Well, with that, uh, Bill will now uh, go over as many uh, sample questions as we can. Uh, we're going to uh, try to do this as quickly as possible. We have uh, about 20 minutes. Um, for those of you that are online, uh, Thomas has the questions uh, up on the, the screen. And for those of you in the, the office, you have a copy right in front of you. Uh, the question 20 uh, pertaining to rule nine in stroke play a player's ball lies in bounds in the general area. The player's swing has interference from a metal chain link fence, not defining out of bounds, but all of which lies out of bounds. 
the player takes relief under the abnormal course conditions relief rule, rule 16.1b, and plays the ball. What is the ruling? So first of all, is the player allowed relief from a chain link fence, which is a immovable obstruction, when all of the fence lies out of bounds? And the answer is no. So what has the player done? They've lifted a ball in play. They put it back into play in a place different from that spot. So essentially they've moved a ball in play under rule 9.4 uh, without replacing it and they simply get the general penalty. Um, if you don't know where to go, the first bullet point under rule 16.1a uh, parentheses two uh, talks about the fact that an obstruction has to be in bounds. Uh, and also uh, that under uh, rule 1.3c4, uh, and it's the third bullet point in terms of uh, multiple penalties. And if we go there in the third, uh, the bullet point under four says plain incorrectly substituted ball from a wrong place. Um, in stroke play, if a player plays a substitute ball and plays that ball from a wrong place, you get two penalty strokes in total. Uh, so the correct answer for number 20 should be C. Uh, if there's not any questions on that, we'll move to question 21. Also under rule nine in stroke play, a player has mark lifted and replaced his ball 20 feet from the hole on the putting green. A gust of wind then blows the ball one foot closer to the hole. He puts it from where it came to rest, meaning a foot closer to the hole. The player gets any penalty, no penalty, what is it? So answer A is no penalty, the stroke counts, and he or she must play the ball as it lies. Answer B, no penalty, but he or she must cancel the stroke and replace the ball uh, in its original position. Answer C, two penalty strokes, the stroke does not count, and he or she must correct the error by uh, replacing the ball in its original position. Or answer D, two penalty strokes, the stroke counts, and he or she must play the ball as it lies. Well, first of all, we know that if we've marked, lifted, and replaced the ball, we own the spot 20 feet from the hole. When the ball was blown closer to the hole, we were required to replace it. When we didn't replace it, and we played a foot closer to the hole than where we were supposed to, we played from a wrong place under that rule. Uh, so we simply get the general penalty of two strokes. The stroke definitely counts uh, because we haven't played from a, a wrong place with a serious breach and we just simply play the ball as it lies. Um, if there's no questions on that, do you kind of understand that? We have a inquisitive. Have replace it in its original, in its original position. No, because we've simply played from a wrong place and a foot closer to the hole would be a two stroke penalty, but it would not be a serious breach. You know, I, I think you'd have a, a little bit of a debate as you start moving closer to the hole. At what point do we get to be a serious breach? And I don't think you'll ever find a rules official <laughs> that will answer that question. Uh, but that's an interesting point. Um, answer or question 22 also to rule nine in a singles match a player's ball is in a penalty area he moves a loose impediment that lies outside the penalty area but is within one club length of the ball before he makes a stroke at the ball it meaning the ball moves coming to rest outside the penalty area it is not known or virtually certain what caused the ball to move. He then plays the ball from its new position outside the penalty area. 
So what penalty does the player get, if any, uh, in this situation? No penalty, one stroke, two strokes, two separate one stroke penalties, or a loss of hole penalty? Uh, well, believe it or not, the correct answer is A, and there'd be no penalty. Um, don't let the uh, loose impediment be moved that's within one club length of the ball. Why? Because that rule stopped being in effect in 2012. Um, so that has nothing to do with it. If it's not known or virtually certain what caused the ball to move, you play the ball from its new location. Furthermore, I'm allowed to now remove a loose impediment when my ball lies in a penalty area. So all added up, player proceeded correctly, and there's no penalty. Um, so there's an example where if you're taking a test, uh, don't try to read more into it thinking that there's a penalty. You just simply go with the facts and what you know. Um, question 23 uh, on rule 10, in which of the following situations does the stroke count in the player's score, but the player does not get the general penalty? So this is a good example of knowing the situations where, you know, the score counts in the player's score, and depending on what he did, there may or may not be a penalty. So a player putts while anchoring the club against his body. That stroke counts. And that would be the general penalty. So that's not the answer. A player taps the ball into the hole with the grip end of his putter. That stroke counts, and that would be a two-stroke penalty. So that's not the correct answer. Answer C, a player makes a stroke at his or her ball while it is moving well beyond the hole after a stroke from the putting green sort of what Bill Nicholson did at the U.S. Open. That stroke counts, and he played a moving ball. That's the general penalty. Answer D, to avoid standing on another player's line of play, a player holds a very short putt with one foot on an extension of his line of play behind the ball. That stroke counts, but that's not a penalty. Why is it not a penalty? It's because he stood on the extension to avoid uh, another player's line of play. And that says that uh, right under rule 10.1D. Um, so the correct answer for 23 is D. Everyone see that? That's a good exercise in terms of whether the stroke counts in the player score and whether or not there's a penalty associated with the action. Uh, question 24, also to Rule 10. In which of the following situations does the player get penalized for the breach of the rules by his or her caddy? Answer A, before the stroke is made and without improving the conditions affecting the stroke, the player's caddy touches the putting green with his finger on the player's line of play to point out a line for putting when the ball is on the putting green. That was new for 2019. You can touch the line of play, provided you don't improve one of the five conditions uh, affecting the stroke. And so that's not the correct answer. Answer B, while the player taps in a six inch putt, his or her caddy deliberately holds an umbrella over the player's head to protect the player from heavy rain. You're not allowed to receive that kind of help from your caddy while you make a stroke. So the player in that instance would be penalized for the caddy holding the umbrella. Uh, so that is the correct answer, but we'll read C and D. In a tournament without any local rules in effect, a player's caddy practices putting on all 18 putting greens on the competition course on the day of the tournament, but before his or her player's starting time in the tournament. Remember that a player is only responsible for his actions of his caddy during the
the round? So that's not the correct answer. And answer D, without player's authorization, his or her caddy marks the spot of the player's ball on the putting green, lifts the ball and cleans it, and then replaces it back on the spot from which it was lifted. Also something new for 2019 that's allowed. So the correct answer for 24 is answer B, uh, that you can't hold an, your caddy can't hold an umbrella over the player's head. Uh, boy, if you got a six inch putt, hold the umbrella yourself and tap it in. I, li I like your chances. Uh, question 25 for rule 11, which of the following, if moved while the player's ball in motion after a stroke from the putting green, would result in the player getting the general penalty. So what we're trying to ask you here is if the player's ball in motion, if I move one of these objects, one of these objects is going to result, if I move it while the ball is in motion, in me getting the general penalty. Well, while the ball is in motion, can I remove a remove flag stick lying on the ground? Answer is yes. So that's not the correct answer. Another player's ball at rest on the putty green near the hole. As of 2019, I can lift a player's ball at rest on the putting green, but that player might want to play Speedy Gonzalez and make sure that you mark that ball prior to lifting it. The player sand wedge lying on the putting green near the hole. That's any other player's equipment, so I can move that. A leaf which had blown into the player's line of play near the hole while the ball was in motion. Um, I can't remove a loose impediment while the ball is in motion. I could before or after the ball was struck, uh, but not while the player's ball is in motion. So the correct answer is D for 25. Moving on to question 26. Before playing a stroke from the fringe of the putting green, which is the general area, a player asked his caddy to attend the flag stick. When the caddy removed the flag stick, the hole liner stuck to it, was pulled out of the hole and in motion when the player's ball struck it. Jim, this is kind of the answer that you had alluded to. Okay, well, you know, when we were going over definitions, one of the things, um, you know, that I've discovered is how important the definitions are. And what is an outside influence? Well, any of these people or things that can affect what happens to a player's ball or equipment or to the course. And it's any natural or artificial object uh, excluding or uh, including another ball in motion except for natural forces. So the cup liner is simply an outside influence and it's in motion. So um, the player must. What must the player do? Cancel and replay the stroke? No. Cancel and replay the stroke and get a two-stroke penalty? No. So the correct answer is going to be C or D. I'm going to play the ball as it lies because I have a ball in motion uh, deflected or stopped by an outside agency. And what does that tell me? It tells me I should play the ball as it lies and there's no penalty. So the correct answer is C under rule 11.1b. Any questions on that one? No? Um, moving on to question 27. Which action is not allowed when a player's ball is in a bunker? Uh, answer A, placing an object such as clubs or rake in the bunker, you can do that, so that's not a penalty. Touching the sand in another similar bunker with a practice swing, believe it or not, as of 2019, that's allowed. Uh, C, removing loose impediments in a bunker with a club. That's something also that was new for 2019. Um, and you can touch the sand in removing the loose impediment, whether it be your hand or club. Touching the sand in the bunker during the back swing, back swing for a stroke which is made. That is prior to making a stroke, so you've touched the sand. Uh, that is one of the prohibitions, so the correct answer is D for rule 20, or question 27. Question 28. 
question 28. Any questions on 27? Yep. Correct. Um, the question was whether or not I um, continue making the stroke. If I touch the sand in making a backswing, I've done it prior to making the stroke, and therefore I would get the penalty whether or not I continue to make that stroke. Uh, question 28, a player's ball lies in a bunker. A rake has been left in another part of the same bunker. Before making a stroke at the uh, ball in the bunker, the player retrieves the rake, something that we see very common. The player also smooths the footprints that he or she just created in retrieving the rake and some other existing footprints in caring for the course. What is the ruling? Answer A, the player does not get a penalty as he or she is allowed to smooth the bunker without restriction in caring for the course. Well, we know that we can smooth the bunker in caring for the course, but we have to remember we can't improve one of the five conditions affecting the stroke, which is the lie of the ball, the stance, the swing, uh, the line of play, or the relief area. <clears throat> B, the player gets the general penalty. The player is not allowed to smooth any footprints until after making his or her next stroke at a ball in the bunker. And prior to 2000, and I think it was 16, we could do that. It was a 12 when that was changed the bunker 12. Um, that would have been the correct answer uh, prior to 2012, uh, but it's not the correct answer in 2020. Answer C, uh, kind of a long answer, but it, it's the correct answer. There is no penalty providing the smoothing, smoothing was done to care for the course, which it was, and that nothing was done to improve the conditions affecting the player's next stroke and the raking was not to test the condition of the sand to learn more information about the next stroke. Kind of a mouthful, but that is the correct answer. And uh, players certainly wouldn't be disqualified for raking some footprints in a bunker. So the correct answer for 28 is C. Question 29 in stroke play, in which of the following does the player get the general penalty? Well, Answer A, a player fixes an animal hoof print on the putting green that is on his line of play. Um, that's an uh, indentation or a hoof indentation, and you can fix that. Answer B, a player fixes an aeration hole on his line of play on the putting green. Uh, that is one of the things that you can't fix, uh, and it makes sense that you can't fix it. You know, if the rules allowed you to fix an aeration hole, uh, if you had a 100-foot putt, it might take you an hour and a half to fix all the airification holes. Um, you can also fix spike marks on the putting green, and you can remove loose soil uh, that is on the putting green. So the correct answer uh, where I would get a penalty if I fixed it would be repairing an airification hole on my line of play on the putting green. Uh, kind of a side note, what if I repaired an airification hole on the putting green that was not on my line of play. Is that permissive? Yeah. It's not improving the conditions affecting the stroke. Um, question 30, during play of the ninth hole, a player's ball comes to rest on a practice putting or chipping green that is near the 10th teen area. What is the ruling? Well, first of all, am I on a putting green or am I on a wrong green? I'm on a wrong green. So I have to follow the procedures in the uh, wrong green rule, which is 13.1F. What do I do? First of all, I must take relief. I don't have a choice. I must determine the nearest point of relief that's off of the wrong green, which as of 2019 includes my stance as well as the lie of the ball. Uh, so the correct answer is the player must determine the nearest point of complete relief and drop the original ball or a substituted ball, another ball, within one club length of and not nearer the hole than that nearest point of complete relief, which is C. Uh, D is not the correct answer because it says may. And I 
would get a two-stroke penalty if I played a ball uh, from that position, uh, as John mentioned towards the end of our uh, rules session today. And finally, question 31, what is the ruling when a part of the ball overhangs the lip of the hole? If it falls into the hole 15 seconds after the player reaches the hole, the ball is considered whole without penalty, provided the player saw it moving after counting to 10. Uh, that's certainly not the correct answer. Uh, the player is entitled to wait until he sees the ball is at rest before counting the 10 seconds. Certainly not the, the correct answer. Answer C, if the ball falls into the hole, 12 seconds after the stroke was made, but before he can reach the hole, the player has holed out with the last stroke with no penalty. That's the correct answer. Um, the 10 seconds is from the time he gets to the hole, not from the time he leaves the spot of where he puts. And the ball is treated as being at rest when it is overhanging the hole and the player reaches the hole. Uh, that's not the correct answer. So the correct answer there is C. Um, one of the things I can tell you with these questions, uh, we're going to make these available to everyone. Uh, we're, we're building uh, with all the sessions a, a pretty good list of questions, and we're going to email those questions out to all the people that have partaken either in person or online uh, once we finish the last sec, um, session covering Rule 24. We'll email out all the questions and we'll uh, be able to have a session where we cover um, more of the questions and then certainly answer any questions and give you uh, the best ways to prepare for the USGA rules test. Uh, hopefully you all find these sessions beneficial. Our next session is next Friday. Uh, I believe that's January 24th at 8 a.m. And the session after that will be Thursday, January 20th, or 30th, excuse me. So our next two sessions are January 24th and January 30th. Uh, until then, we look uh, forward to uh, some great weather here in Wisconsin, another six to 10 inches of snow. Uh, other than that, uh, we hope you have a great uh, rest of your week. Thank you all for joining us.